deal with uh, this afternoon. One being the personal data in the GLA group where we're going to be gathering evidence. And the second one, the response of London resilience to the Grenfell Tower fire. Uh, just before we do that, we've got some formal business to do. One of our guests, in terms of the first item on the personal data, is stuck in traffic. I'm looking at the TfL representative at the moment who's sitting there, uh, who's not responsible. Um, and, and so we might rearrange or uh, change some of our formal questions in terms of that uh, until she arrives. So let's begin the formal part of the meeting then. So can I take any apologies for absence? Uh, and I think we have uh, Keith Prince deputising for Sean... Hey, yes, is that correct? No, uh, oh. no, no, Chair. We have Sorry. apologies from uh, Assembly Member Coffey. Oh, right. Only from... from oh, a member of the committee. Oh, right. A member of the committee. Sorry. So that's a mistake in my notes. Okay, apologies for that. Okay, then moving on uh, to declarations of interest. Can we note the list of officers held by Assembly Members? Uh, members are asked to declare any disclosable, truly interesting specific items listed on the agenda and declare any other relevant interests. Uh, you've got the address before you. Are there any? No. Nope. Let's move on to item three. Can we confirm the minutes of our meeting on the 18th of July 2017 to be signed by me? Thank you very much. Can we move to item four, summary list of actions? Can we note the actions arising from our previous meetings? Agreed. And then can we move to item five and welcome our guests? Um, so I'm going to just go through as I listed in my briefing paper. So we've got Bob Farley, Head of Information, Law and Security at the Metropolitan Police Service. Okay. Welcome. Paul Wiley, Director of Strategy at MOPAC. Uh, that's the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime. Uh, Elizabeth Denham. Up. Oh, stuck in traffic, the Information Commissioner. So we'll do that introduction. Uh, Avier Ruiz. Uh, Policy Director of Open Rights Groups, um, Renata Sampson, Chief Exec of Big Brother Watch, welcome. Now, Richard Bevin, Head of Information Governance, TfL, and we've got Tom Middleton, our own Tom Middleton, Head of Finance and Governance at the GLA. Okay, so we're going to have to, you're going to have to just bear with us as we make, sort of sort out our first lines of questions, and I think I'm going to go straight to... Um, our second set of questions that's on the agenda. So, um, if I can begin with, so in terms of um, second set, yeah. And I think it is. Is it Sean? So we're going to go straight to you. Is that all right? If I yep, start with that. Fine. Okay. Um, well. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have sent out a uh, questionnaire to each of the, the GLA organisations asking about your use of personal data in, in some detail, um, and that's, we've got a report back on that um, in our briefing packs. Um, but as part of the meeting, can I, can I ask each of you in turn, maybe going around the table that way, um, can you outline, not so much in detail, what data you collect, but, but in general, what's the benefits of collecting it and, and what do you use it for to actually get benefits for, for London? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, just briefly in that case, because quite a few people to go around. Um, the, the GLA's use of personal data, as you probably appreciate, is more limited uh, than, than some of the other bodies, uh, just because the nature of our functions. So uh, traditionally, we've, we've, we've not really had much uh, held here. Um, in recent years, we've had slightly more held here, and some of the members will be familiar with uh, Talk London, which is for polling purposes. Uh, you're familiar with Team London, which holds personal data related to uh, volunteering. Uh, we also uh, got something called Housing Moves, which is a uh, housing initiative uh, with um, uh, details of people's uh, personal addresses and so forth. Um, so, relatively limited. There are some areas, they're the main areas I've just described. Um, we only have one formal uh, data sharing agreement, and that's with, with TfL, 
and that's to do with volunteering actually, and that's to do with um, uh, over 18 Oyster Card customer data. So to see if people are interested in volunteering, so that relates to the Team London thing. That's the only uh, form of agreement we have in place. So we'll ask about data sharing sort of next as, the, as a separate question. Okay, fine. Um, so at, at the moment, fairly limited going forward maybe slightly more in the same sort of areas I've, I've talked about, but nowhere near the scales and the others. Um, TFL? Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, there was a lot of detail in our questionnaire response, um, so, so I won't repeat that, but uh, as, as Tom intimates, uh, in contrast to the GLA, TFL does collect and process and hold a lot of personal data um, from the ticketing system, from, from Oyster and Contactless. Uh, we have customer accounts uh, in quite a number of areas of our operations, so the, the cycle hire scheme, the congestion charging scheme, uh, uh, depends on customer accounts, is managed through customer accounts with, with an associated amount of personal data. Um, di dial a ride scheme, uh, we have the personal data of the users of that scheme, which is obviously actually quite sensitive personal data often as well. Um, we uh, obviously regulate the taxi and private hire trade, which, which involves the personal data of, a, of drivers and applicants for, for, to be drivers. Um, uh, you'll, I'm sure, be familiar with, with the CCTV network that we operate uh, on the tube and elsewhere, uh, which, which is quite extensive. Um, and, uh, and of course, we're, we're also quite a large employer, so, so we have a lot of employees' personal data uh, as well. Um, we collect all of this so that we can run our services, I think. Um, the, the ticketing system depends on, on the use of personal data um, and then ob obviously that provides, uh, you know, TfL couldn't run without a ticketing system of some sort. Uh, the CCTV cameras provide security on the tube and help us manage the infrastructure as, as well. Um, the cameras that we have on the street uh, help us enforce the congestion charge or enforce other regulations on the roads that we manage. Um, so, so that's, yeah, we, we see it all as, as being essential to the delivery of our services, okay. in summary. Thank you very much. Um, Mopac, yes. you're, you're strictly our GLA body. You yeah. keep data for your, for your own purposes as well. It's not, I mean, separately from the police. To, to a limited yeah. extent. Uh, I won't surprise you, you know, it's a very small organisation, so there's the HR uh, information of our own staff, uh, and, and to a limited extent, a bit like Tom, uh, there is survey data of uh, people that we can send newsletters to and people who uh, re reply to us in terms of consultations, but it's largely limited to that. Can I just ask quickly, you also sort of scrutinise the police. Yes. Do you have an oversight role over their use of data in any, in any sense? We do, and I can elaborate on that now or later, but um, yes, there, there's an oversight function um, of, of the Metropolitan Police. We clearly have um, much more of the data. So you'd be the person responsible for that? So the information governance scrutiny as well as yeah. the information governance within MOPAC. That's right. Yeah. Right, okay, thank you. We'll have some more questions on that later. Um, MPS. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, yes, obviously uh, we process large amounts of uh, personal data. The uh, purpose for that is obviously prevention, detection of crime, <coughs> apprehension of offenders, um, prosecution of offenders and safeguarding. Um, so there's a major... Um, Objective is obviously is to record uh, crime incidents, the victims, offenders, suspects uh, at that level, and also incident information, so 999 calls, uh, major inquiries, and um, intelligence information. In, in addition, uh, as, as with the others, obviously, there's, we're a large body, and, and there's also the HR information around our, our staff and offices. Okay, we will discuss more yeah, about sure. things later on. Can I ask why the Met only completed our questionnaire up to question seven? Um, we didn't, to my knowledge. Oh, uh, is that uh, right? It was, it was, it, well, I mean, uh, I, I have a record of what we, what we submitted, but I understand uh, Steve asked for some additional information that clearly didn't come through at some point, we but it was we, completed. In we will check that out we'll then. Check that out. Yeah, yeah. Pick that up. Yeah, yeah, okay, so because I want to move on to data sharing now. Um, 
and that's where the, the data scenario yeah. questions start within our questionnaire and we've been provided with a diagram based on the information <laughs> that's been right. given back to us um, and obviously the Met is not linked into to many of these things in the way that we would have expected so I think there might be a lack of information about the data sharing that the Met yeah. does or but rather what is shared with the Met. I think Sean, the, 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 the guests might be difficult because they probably haven't seen that diagram. Yeah, can that, can that be reviewed for our final report? Because I think there are we, some gaps. We can, we can look at that. Um, and no doubt what we might hear today is some of those gaps. So you're going to have to Great. talk through it, a particular relationship <coughs> that you wish to highlight. Okay, we'll yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. That may be the best way. Okay, so can I start with the GLA again and ask you what data you share both with other GLA organisations and also if you share any outside of the GLA? Yeah, um, as, as I was saying earlier, we, we only have one uh, actual formal arrangement and that's with, with TfL for the when people uh, uh, re renew or first apply for Oyster cards and that's to encourage young people to volunteer through Teamland, which is on the back of the, of the 24 games, and that's purely names and email addresses, so it's, it's fairly limited, it's important we don't disclose it, but it's fairly, fairly limited personal data, um, and uh, as usual, it's, it's an opt-in basis, which I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll touch on later, that's, that's the only formal uh, arrangement we have, we don't routinely share outside of that. Can I ask you about the um, chain database, because that's, I think, a GLA monitored database. It's the, the link database that the various homelessness agencies use um, to share information about people who they are helping on, on or off the streets. Um, there's been some concern lately that, that data from that is being shared with the Home Office. That doesn't seem to be in your responses to us yet. Is that, is that something that you oversee or is that something separate? I have never heard of the chain database, to be absolutely honest. So you think it's, so it's not a GLA? I'm, if it is, I'm not aware of it, but I'm, I'll oh. happily clarify that point. But Mo I, MOPAC I, are indicating it. Um, if it was helpful, I used, I, I'm relatively new to MOPAC. Before that, I was five years as Director of Immigration Enforcement for London in the Home Office. And right. I can tell you, can tell you that the chain data is only um, shared in a, at a kind of a macro level and not um, the uh, specific individuals or anything like that. It is shared. Uh, it is, uh, but I don't know who owns them. Okay, so. we'll find that out okay. later as well. Um, TfL, your your data sharing is quite extensive because yeah. of your you're you're more like a commercial operator, aren't you? So you have lots of different relationships. Can you yeah. run us quickly through those? Yeah, yeah. Uh, ex to expand it, if if I can, on what was in our questionnaire response. Um, we we share data with with quite a large number of other mainly public sector bodies, but but not exclusively. Um, as Tom says. Uh, we have an arrangement with the GLA. Um, that, I think, is, is our only formal regular data sharing um, with other GLA bodies, if technically you exclude the, the MET from, from being a, a part of the, of the GLA group. Um, but, so other public bodies that, that we do share personal data with uh, would be the, the police forces, pr primarily London police forces, but, but not exclusively, with obviously the, the MET being, being the main recipient there. Um, uh, and a range of other public agencies who, particularly if they have fraud detect detection or prevention uh, responsibilities, so, so we are um, uh, sharing personal data with um, the Home Office we, in, in uh, limited capacity um, relating to applicants for taxi and private hire roles uh, to, in order to check the entitlement to work in the UK. Um, we, uh, we have other arrangements for, for fraud prevention with the DWP. Um, uh, we receive requests from HMRC. Um, and uh, similarly, for fraud, a bit with the same purpose of, of fraud prevention, we also exchange personal data with uh, commercial organisations, insurers, uh, motor insurance industry particularly. Um, we... we uh, we share with um, a, a range of organisations that uh, play some part in, in our delivery of service. Um, that's, that's sort of under data processing arrangements rather than data sharing. Um, uh, so, so that's sort of done on an entirely different governance basis. I don't know if you want to explore that here now as well. 
So that, those, that would be with companies who are providing a service for us, rather than when we're sharing data for, for an organisation's own purposes. Um, so that would be, uh, a classic example would, would be Serco or Capita uh, running the congestion charge or the cyber hire scheme for us under contract. Uh, but personal data is, is obviously involved in that process. Um, so that, that's, that's some of the main organisations that we share data with. On that last point, when you outsource um, something like running the, the cycle hire scheme, um, you rely on the company's own sort of data protection and policies, or do we, as London, have our, any sort of additional requirements that we impose upon them? Uh, TfL has its own bespoke set of requirements that, that we are um, very strict about imposing through contractual arrangements. Um, we, we, which place obligations on the company to do what we tell them okay. so that they control the personal data as we require them to do. So there's essentially one policy at TfL level that then cascades? Yes, there, there's one yeah. policy and there's one standard set of contractual clauses that, that forms the basis for, for all of our contractual arrangements and it flows out across the whole, uh, whole range of services that we outsource. Okay, that's, that's useful. Yeah. Um, Mo? Yeah, so um, it would... There are a, a, a few um, data sharing arrangements, but they are limited to the evaluation of um, uh, kind of pilots or programs that have been commissioned by MOPAC. So MOPAC has a commissioning arm that deals with things like the Crime Prevention Fund, um, certain bespoke um, issues like knife crime. And in that respect, uh, there will be uh, a limited amount of personal data to evaluate whether or not those schemes were successful. So as an example, um, Redfred uh, works in, in the NHS um, and in order to know, ensure that we know it's working or not, we are evaluating its success and so there will be a limited amount of personal uh, data uh, which was covered by the original commissioning uh, in terms of contract. Okay, that's, that's very useful, thank you. Um, the police, yes. in terms of data you hold and which you share with other people, do you want to, to start with that? Yes, uh, I mean, local authorities is, is, is a major um, area in terms of sharing in support of the Crime and Disorder Act. Um, so housing, uh, that sort of thing, domestic violence, um, antisocial behaviour. Uh, we also sort of share information with fire and uh, ambulance service around um, safety issues. Um, Health service in, 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 in sort of general, um, and obviously receive a lot of information from from the health service in, in safeguarding issues. Um, obviously, a lot of uh, other law enforcement bodies as well, you know, in addition to, to other forces, and um, and TfL in relation to crime on the, on transport. So essentially, this is data that you collect in the in the course of your work yes. that then raises yes. issues that yes. other public authorities yes. need to be yes. concerned uh, with, yeah. and you and pass that on. General partnership uh, mm -hmm. arrangement. So um, it's very much a sort of multi-agency approach, say to things like uh, mental health uh, and those sort of things, um, and, and sort of safeguarding vulnerable individuals, um, which can only be dealt with you know, collectively with, uh, with information from all all the relevant parties. Mm -hmm. um, where it's a, say a, a domestic abuse type incident, it obviously may be police information that's the catalyst for reported incidents and um, it's, it's sort of multi-agency multi in terms of actually coming up with the solution. Um, so yeah, yeah generally, generally a, a lot of sharing of information but each agreement that we produce goes through a, a rigorous process to make sure that's consistent with the policing purpose and that that information is, is protected through that through that sharing process. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm a local councillor, so I do appreciate yeah. this whole yeah. like safeguarding yeah. and a multi-agency type yeah. approach. All of this is very, very sensitive information, yes. though, so you must have quite rigorous sort of training in the sensitive nature of the, day, of the information to yeah, the officers uh, who are... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it all, all, all our staff undergo um, basic training on, on entry, uh, and then that's reinforced through um, specific computer courses and, 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 and that, that sort of thing. So um, all, all staff are subject to um, our information management policy, 
uh, around the appropriate use of that information. And it's a reinforcer as to be for genuine policing, policing duties. Okay. Can, we, can I now ask about information that you gather in from yeah. other places within the GLA? I, mean, I believe there's, you already talked about CCTV at Transport for London, I believe there's an agreement there. Can you run us through what you collect in for policing purposes? Um, well, yes, I mean, it's, it's the congestion charging um, information it is, is, is one piece uh, through the um, uh, reads on, on cameras. Um, and then it would be case by case sort of information coming in um, through through incident response pr primarily. So when you say it's congestion charging, that's the, the number plates that are, are the, captured the, by yes, the congestion yes, charging system. Yes. Um, and how long do you hang on to those for? Uh, at the moment it's them? two years um, and we're currently under national discussion uh, around reducing that to one year. Okay, and, has and that's that... the reads, that's not, that's not, that's the reads of the vehicle passing through the camera, not the images of the vehicle. So it's the data that results yes. from yes. the NPR, not, yes. the, not the images yes. themselves. And has that, has that changed in recent years, that agreement? Um, the, the national agreement has been, has been two years, um, and recent discussions nationally, um, which the Information Commission's Office staff have been involved in, um, are, are now considering reducing that to a two-year retention national. Okay. Can I ask about oyster, <coughs> oyster data? Um, from a TfL, sorry, I'm going to ask both of you the same question at once. Um, Transport for London originally, I think, kept when it first started the Oyster system, kept hold of the data on where you've travelled for a month. And well, yeah. So last time I logged into my my card, it was giving me two months worth of data. Do you know when that changed? It's always been eight weeks. That's odd because when I asked about it in 2005, it was definitely one one month that was being. Well, I think Oyster was, was pretty much brand new in 2005, and, yeah. and so was I in TFL. Yeah. But, but my understanding is that it's always been eight weeks. Okay, okay, fair so enough. Technically, actually destroyed in or disaggregated from the individual in the ninth week. So. Okay. And do the police have access to that in the same way as they do to the ANPR? Only through an mm -hmm. individual request basis. On request. Right. So I'm using uh, data protections. Exemptions. So if you have So if there was a genuine individual that we were interested in, and we believe that they travelled on the tube, then that would be a direct request through a information sharing agreement, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's and then useful. obviously that information would, would be retained relevant to that that investigation inquiry. So if it was going through the court, it would be retained as, as evidence if it was valid. And we have a process at our end to, to assess those requests as, as they come in from the Met uh, and make a decision on, on, on each one on an individual basis. Okay, and then finally to the police. Um, there was a recent case reported where a victim of crime was ended up being investigated by the Home Office and was, was it seemed like the police had passed on that information. Do you have an agreement with the Home Office to, to do that if you have suspicions about somebody's immigration status, even if they're a victim of crime? I'm not aware of an agreement, but if we identified a crime being committed, then and, and that was the appropriate investigating body, then I'm, I would imagine that would be a, a disclosure we would make. But I'm not, not aware of the specifics of this case or a, or a specific agreement being in place with Home Office. We could certainly clarify that. Okay, that would be that would yeah, be very yeah, useful to yeah. know if there was any kind of requirements, because I mean, if somebody comes forwards and there's clear evidence that somebody's reported somebody and all of that, that's different than if somebody is merely a victim to actually go and investigate their immigration status. It seems, it seems odd. Um, I think that's all my questions. Are there any of the other members? OK, thank you very much. That's no, no, uh, well, sorry, that's all my questions about data... Sh oh, uh, about continue on. We were going to continue on and ask um, the, the relevant groups whether they... Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll just um, we'll continue on. Carry on with the <laughs> No, I just wondered if there are any, because I just ask a lot of supplementaries. No, I was wondering. You want to pause for a breather? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of your members want to ask any more? There's any questions you want to. I, don't, I didn't see anyone indicate no, there, so I think we plough on. Okay, because we're moving on now to um, Big Brother, Brother Watch and Open Rights Group, who are um, campaigners in this area to keep, keep a very close eye on data protection. Um, so, starting maybe with Big Brother Watch, can I ask you? 
so what are the key risks of having these GLA organisations collecting data and, and sharing it with each other? What, what might go wrong? Um, I would argue that it's just fundamental issue of data sharing full stop in that um, obviously we've heard that data is increasing all the time. I go to great pains to try and express to uh, society as a whole that we are now all digital citizens and that we are our data and that data isn't just a sort of supplementary part of our lives, it's actually fundamental to who we are in a connected age. So therefore, uh, historical approaches towards data as in a piece of paper and photocopying a piece of paper and handing it and sharing it, that simply doesn't exist when you can transfer vast quantities of data uh, acquire, share, retain vast quantities of data, which is often quite very personal data or sensitive data. So I think all organisations uh, are at risk of just the way we live today in that they need or want to acquire data and share data to improve services and improve uh, uh, customer experience or even people's lives. But there is an inherent risk that as soon as you acquire a piece of data and share it, it's out of your control. Um, we certainly find with uh, reports that we've undertaken about data breaches that uh, human error is a, is a natural problem. Um, you can't ever account for human error. And there are ongoing problems with data breaches. Our last report uh, from summer of last year about uh, entitled Safe in Police Hands about police data breaches showed that between 2011 and 2015 there were at least 2,315 data breaches undertaken by the police, ranging in variety, uh, ranging in severity. Uh, um, so, you know, uh, just sharing a piece of information uh, inaccurately is one thing, providing criminal gangs with information is quite another, but they're obviously quite rare. But, um, you know, we, we find similar issues of data breaches across uh, the NHS um, uh, and other public services. But obviously, that's the area that the Information Commission is, <laughs> knows much more about than, than I. But fundamentally, the, we have to all be very aware now, and I don't think we are as society or as leaders or as businesses or organisations, that our data is so fundamentally critical to who we are as people that it requires... Um, a greater protection, a greater sense of absolute need rather than in, wouldn't it be helpful um, than we've probably experienced before. Can I ask you what, what sort of the, how the public ought to be consulted about things like this as well? Because this uh, yeah, is one I of the mean, things it's... where, like as I say, I, I'm, I'm asking these questions because things mm. have come up, but way after when maybe you'd expect to have been asked if this could happen. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, education is a really critical issue. The, the, <laughs> I believe that the majority of us, if not all of us, are um, effectively blind to what our data is and the impact that our data can have. That almost our five senses are, are sort of obscured um, and that we rely solely on trust. For those of us over a certain age, if you used to ask me my name, my address, my date of birth, I'd give it to you because I could see the obvious purpose for why you were asking it. In, a di in the digital connected age, it's not always that obvious. Um, often we're asked to provide very personal uh, data just purely because it's for no actual purpose, just purely because an organisation thinks that there's some value in it, but we can't necessarily see the value ourselves. So, we've all got to learn what it means to be a digital citizen. That, I believe, will start to sink in more with us as we become victims of crime in relation to our data. Uh, the Equifax uh, breach that occurred at the end of last week, at the point when we actually find out if any British citizens have been involved in that, when we discover that the eight years of uh, very sensitive financial data that is held on us by uh, credit reference agencies such as Equifax, a lot of people will, will, won't know what to do in order to seek redress for the sheer volume of data that's been lost on them. I mean, 143 American citizens have lost very sensitive data. Now, at the point that you find that you lose your identity or that you are vulnerable to data breach or you start getting weird emails or 
your general well-being and day-to-day -day life is impacted and it transpires that that's in relation to a data, to data loss that's happened, then I think individuals will start to take greater control. But equally, they need to be provided with the, with the facility uh, uh, um, and the, the, the regulations to ensure that, that the, the control is there. Today, the Data Protection Bill was launched. Um, uh, it's 200 pages, so don't ask me to go through it all. <laughs> um, but that's based it, uh, on the General Data Protection Regulation, mm -hmm. which is providing, uh, uh, strengthening the current Data Protection Act and providing a number of rights that citizens do have to ensure that they can question how their data is used, raise concern if a decision has been made by automated means, by machine learning, which as we go further into AI and the world of AI and virtual reality is going to be absolutely fundamental. Okay, yeah. We will have more questions about the, the new sure. legislation soon. So, um, <laughs> I will stop wittering on. Thank you very much. Though. Um, Javier from Open Rights. So, um, for us, um, we've been doing some work recently with a charity around the issues on risk and benefits with public sector. We've been going to Birmingham, Manchester, Sheffield, and other local consortium for the local authorities. I mean, that report will be published uh, soon. I think it will be quite useful probably for the committee to understand. But something we found is that there are different types of risks when we look at data, and I think there is the things we've been discussing, like the risk of external abuse, like uh, loss, hacking, and I think that's the kind of concern that most people have in mind to, to a degree that is also the concern that Renat has been explaining of the uh, internal misuse or misuse which where you understand that there is a misuse like a corrupt employee or unauthorized cases or uh, sharing data without an agreement. But the areas that we think are also important particularly for the public sector are um, risks of unintended consequences of sharing, like for example, uh, before you were discussing the possibility of the Home Office being informed of the immigration status of someone, of a victim of crime. If there is an, there are some data sharings that may trigger statutory processes, so things that automatically set things in motion, you may not have thought about that, uh, you may be looking at stigmatization, you may want to share data, for example, there's a lot of discussion around uh, free school meals and children and schools knowing who uh, deserves uh, free school meals and there is also a big discussion around the stigmatization. So that is a slightly different risk and that is what I think that public sector bodies need to start looking in a slightly more sophisticated way because um, a lot of it may actually not be in breach of any data protection legislation but there could be an ethical and a moral risk. And finally even more, you know, you could have risks around the policy itself. For example, the policy to share data about immigration status, you know, I mean, that is, you're probably not breaking any laws, but, you know, there are some, particularly for the public sector, there are, there's a need to understand what the implications are for some data sharing policies, and we are, that is particularly common now when we're looking at fraud and debt, you know, I mean, where do you want to put the limits, where do you, where do you see the limits of the state, and how much information the public sector should hold on citizens, then, in you know, risks, cannot be understood uh, completely in separation from the benefits that you intend. And there again, you know, we've been looking at different types of, how different types of benefits, you know, really need to be understood. So there is the, obviously, when you use data to improve public services for direct benefit of individuals, and that's a very clear benefit. But there are, uh, we hear about public benefits when what you're looking at is actually benefits to the organization, whether it's efficiency, or other type of improvements. And in many cases, what we hear is that there is almost like an automatic understanding that this will benefit citizens and the public. But in many cases, I think that you need to actually demonstrate that there is a benefit rather than just make an assumption that that will take place. And finally, I think that there are there is data used for punitive state functions like um, taxation, police, debt, and fraud. And again, you know, that is quite different. Obviously, you are not going to look at anything to do with consent, probably, in that context, you know, but you still need to look at how you do uh, things fairly. So I think that in terms of risk, I mean, at the moment, we are still, we don't think, I mean, we have a concrete um, concern here, particularly I can tell you, uh, AMPR, uh, face recognition, you know, and several, there are a few things that were, but we have concerns, but we also think that it would be useful for a public sector body or for the government assembly to have a broad understanding of how risks apply in the public sector. Okay, just to clarify one, one thing that you said yeah. there. Um, you, you, I think you mentioned that, that sometimes you can collect data that then gives you an obligation to share yeah. it, such as immigration status. For example, that, yeah. It could be your, you, yeah, I mean, there are some, sometimes if you know something, you have to do, uh, yes. you have to take action. And in that case, I mean, 
it may be the right thing to do, but you probably want to know that that is going to happen before you start sharing data and be prepared for the consequences. Yeah. Or before you start collecting the data. Yeah, yeah. okay. Do, you, do we want to move to no, I, Shall I carry on I with this section? it's very important we get this section out in terms of information. Great, OK, so... so and, and members will come in when they want. Okay. Um, I want to ask... Apologies to the Information Commissioner for waiting, making you wait. Thank you for coming. Can I ask the GLA, please? Um, in response to um, the government's consultation on um, expanding the sharing of uh, personal data between public agencies, the GI's response said um, it wanted it. It was disappointed by the limited scope and wanted um, more powers to share more personal data. Can can you explain why the GLA gave that response? In particular, when it said it wanted to share um, data with private companies. Yeah, um, give it a little bit of context there. Um, so ju just like uh, the other bodies in the group, um, our use of personal data only, only rests on the functions that we. Have. So we're not looking to collect personal data for the sake of collecting personal data. In fact, we go to quite uh, extreme lengths not to collect personal data on occasion. I'll just give you one example, which you're probably familiar with, Sean, is the, the Boiler Scrappage Scheme. So that would be personal data of homeowners and so forth on that. And um, that's all held by the Energy Savings Trust. We don't actually have that information. So that's just one example where we are actually taking steps not to hold personal data. But I think if I've, if I've got it right, the particular consultation response you refer to is some of my colleagues who work on this more on the sort of intelligence and statistics side were, were using the word I don't think they were actually talking about personal data at all. They were just they were just kind of they were just keen to have more data available, a bit like the data store stuff. Um, now if, if that is in any way incorrect I shall I I, 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 shall, I, shall, I shall let you know. But the, if it's the same one that you're referring to that I'm thinking of, I think they were just talking about more data in general as per the data store, which is a kind of transparency thing rather than the personal uh, data thing. So we, as far as I'm aware, we have very few ambitions indeed to get more personal data. Uh, I am aware of a proposal, and I think there's probably a decision posted on our website, and I, I know Jeff might know about this a bit, bit about this as well, the London Office of Data Analytics, which again, that same team, the intelligence unit, is, is leading on setting up, and that's about data sharing with boroughs. But again, a lot of that will not be anywhere near personal data. A lot of that will be sort of you know, the usual kind of public sector data, uh, if it does stray into the, the realms of, of personal data, then we also have to be very careful. But that's, that's not, it's not the intention. It's more the intention for a bit like the data store, just to have stuff that would be of interest to the public around, around uh, uh, what public bodies <coughs> are up to. So um, I can assure you we, 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 don't have, we don't have huge ambitions to have more personal data. In fact, in fact quite the opposite. I don't think, I don't think we need to. Because as, as you already noted, risks are attached. The more you have, the more likely it is just through human error that it, it strays outside the building. So essentially, that was kind of like a misspeaking. They, what was meant was more sort of statistics and yeah. depersonalised sort of what's called big data. Yeah. I think like, is that like the, the phrase data, that's used like, for it. Like the data store stuff, which yeah. I, I hope is viewed as the sort of the good side of this coin, which is transparency and you know, nothing to do with individuals, no one's identifiable, um, and so forth. So, yeah, but as I say, if there's anything that troubles you, we can, we can have a look. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question to the Information Commission. <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, if I could ask you just, we'll, we'll ask you a more general question, I think, in a moment, but if I could ask you just to comment on that sort of last point of where, where lots of data is collected, um, are there any additional benefits and risks to, to doing that if you can turn it into sort of anonymised, aggregated data? Um, or does it bring extra risks? What, what are you doing to look at? Well, it's a, it's a clon uh, complex area. I mean, if you, if you need data and you need to process data and you need to share data for good public policy reasons and for the flip side, the transparency that public bodies might want to have with the public, um, then we would encourage aggregating and anonymizing data as, as a good practice. The challenge is that many organizations don't do it properly. So if you are going to aggregate information, if you're going to anonymize information, you need to be very careful that the data set that you're putting out there can't be re-identified by linking, let's say, data sets with other publicly available information. So that risk of re-identification um, is actually addressed in the new uh, data protection bill 
that, as Renata said, was, was tabled today, was published today, there's now a sanction and a penalty for re-identification of data. And I think that's a good thing because it'll drive good practice to properly de-identify or anonymize information so that it can be used for good public policy purposes. But it has to be done well. And it's a risky area because the more data that's out there, the more ability people have to put data sets together and then somebody who wasn't identified in a new context now is. So I hope that's, that makes sense to you. It, it does. The sanctions that are proposed, are they against all the people who released all the data that was then re-aggregated so, <laughs> or, or...? So if an, if an organisation takes steps to purposely re-identify then there is a sanction against them and then our office would have the ability to investigate the lack of um, proper processes in the release of the data, if that makes sense. So there's sort of two sides to it. But we want to discourage people from re-identification. That makes sense. Yeah. I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Let's move on to individual rights. Um, Navin Shah. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions on uh, individual rights and uh, best to our uh, uh, GLA, TFL and police colleagues. Uh, the first one is that uh, how do you get cons consent uh, from individuals to process uh, their personal data? You want to start, Tom? Uh, thank you. Um, just, just briefly. Um, I'm sure the others want a chance to speak as well. Um, the uh, our preferred approach, as you probably appreciate from having seen our website, is to, is to ask people to opt in uh, and, and not, not to assume consent. And in the context of our website, one thing I should mention, which I think um, members and uh, uh, colleagues will be aware of, is we're combining the microsites and the main site to uh, bring greater consistency. So we've had, we've had a whole series of microsites in the past, which have, you know, obviously have their own way of doing things. Uh, which include things like Talk London and Team London. So there is going to be a, 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 a sort of in the process of being a single website, and you, and you go off there into the various bits to, to get what you want, which is which obviously helpful in this context. You're going to get different policies on different parts of the uh, of the web. Um, and so there were two uh, areas where we uh, um, assume consent. I think we said this in our response to your uh, questionnaire. Mm -hmm. Uh, the CCTV here at City Hall, which I think you're aware of, and uh, in, when individuals uh, correspond with us, uh, it's a bit difficult to do anything about that. So that's that's where we're at. In, in TFL, we um, <coughs> we're, we're very conscious that, that consent is only one of the um, bases in, in the current legislation that allows us to, to collect and process personal data. Um, so that often there's an alternative legal basis for, for us to, to do uh, what we do with personal data. So a lot of the time we're, we're only doing something because TFL has a statutory power to, to do it, um, and that is a legal basis for, for processing personal data. So, so that's relevant to all of the uh, on-street enforcement we do around whether that's the congestion charge or, or penalty charge notices on, on the road network. Um, uh, c that comes back to the to the fact that we've got a statutory power to, to collect the personal data that, that we need uh, to do those enforcement activities, um, and and similarly with, with the revenue enforcement on on the tube. Um, the, uh, another basis is um, for the performance of a contract, uh, which, which covers an awful awful lot of the processing that we do to deliver um, a ticketing product to to. Um, to an individual who, who's, who's bought that product or uh, signed up for that product. Um, or, and that's also very relevant to the employment context as well, where, where we process employees' personal data uh, in order to fulfil our, our employment contract with that individual as, as well. Um, and there's other bases in, in the Data Protection Act, and, and there will be other bases in, in the GDPR and the new bill that, that will supplement the, the provisions around consent. So we don't rely on consent uh, an awful lot. Uh, we do um, uh, gather people's express consent to receive marketing from us. Um, we don't actually do very much marketing, but, but we do gather um, 
uh, pe people's opt-in consent to receive marketing information from us if they're um, registering their Oyster card, for instance. Um, but, but in general, we, we don't do a lot that is reliant on consent. I'll, I'll be quite quick. It's uh, similar to Tom's position. It's uh, consent where there's correspondence or as part of a consultation. Uh, and then outside of that, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, using data that others have, have, have gathered for the purposes of evaluation, you know, that, that's consent or otherwise is obtained at the point of the kind of third party rather than ourselves. Uh, yeah, in, in terms of policing, we try and avoid relying on consent, certainly where we can rely on our policing powers to gather information. Um, the areas where um, we may get involved in cons obtaining an individual's explicit consent is perhaps in some um, diversion techniques that we use in, with offenders um, to, to, to opt into some sort of diversionary uh, scheme. Um, um, similarly with victims to participate in um, um, sort of, uh, those sort of initiatives as well. Uh, and then victim support scheme referrals uh, are really the only other areas that I can, I can, I can imagine that we, we regularly rely on, on consent. Um, there are some uh, public surveys that are undertaken as well where, where, where people, uh, victims may get surveyed around their experience with, with policing. Um, where, where the individual will be offered the opportunity to participate in that telephone survey or not. Um, so that, that's it, as I say. It's, it, it's really, we, we're relying on our policing powers in the majority of cases because consent can be withdrawn. Uh, well, my, my second question is uh, about uh, scope for individuals to opt out of uh, having their personal data being collected or those individuals to manage their own personal data. Again, maybe Bob, you might want to come in and then go on. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, so in terms of managing, there's, there's limited scope at the moment for individuals to uh, manage their data other than mm. using the provisions within uh, the Data Protection Act for, mm -hmm. for subject access to, to review the information that we're holding about a member of the public uh, or, or our own people. Um, Obviously, the individuals can can raise an objection uh, to to that processing, and that will that will be dealt with in, in accordance with the provisions of the Data Protection Act. Um, the only real sort of dynamic thing that we have going on at the moment is is, is the ability to report a crime online. Um, yeah, yeah um, that, that we don't yet have. Although I think you know, the ambition is at some point to uh, label um, victims of crime, perhaps to to view. Uh, the progress of their, their, their crime case, but at the moment that's not available, unfortunately. Well, in terms of managing information, if uh, an individual wished to kind of be removed from any uh, communications database we have, they, they simply need to reply and we will absolutely do so. Uh, in addition, uh, should they write in for Freedom of Information or DPA, then again we will process that and, and kind of remove anything that they, they wish. But, as I said, the, the, the amount of information in this regard is quite limited from the back. Similarly, if, if we are contacted with, with a request, whether that's um, to, to have communications, to have information deleted, removed from, from correspondence databases or, or from other databases, we, we will act on those requests in, in accordance with the, the current legislation. And we provide the ability to, to opt out of any of our regular communications uh, um, around services uh, on, on the tube or, or whatever it may be. Um, you, you can unsubscribe to those uh, very easily. But, but it sort of more broadly, if y you can't opt out of having some personal data processed <coughs> if, if you use Oyster to travel, um, for instance, um, uh, uh, at present. I think our position is very similar to MOPAC's in the sense of there's a limited amount and people are free to opt out. I think, I think one of the things we're trying to do is, part of the move to GDPR, is move to a situation, say, on um, Seven Talk London, where people can manage their own accounts so they can actually you know, manage information held on them or, or delete it in time. So that would be a, a move in the direction we're looking for. On, on, on the same uh, issue of individual rights, I've got a question for Renata. Uh, what, what else uh, should uh, organisations in the GLA uh, can uh, 
uh, GLA group can do to help individuals control their personal data and uh, which other organizations do this better or as well? Um, it's quite interesting, just coming yeah. back to the points that were made earlier about wanting to gather more data but not realising that it was necessarily personal data. It comes back to my point that we are all yeah. our data and wherever we go, the fact that we've got a mobile telephone in our pocket, the fact that we've got an Oyster card or a credit card or a debit card means that that is all data. Yes, now yes. that's data that's really interesting to want to see and analyse but it's still, more often than not, not industrial data, but personal, personal data. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, also interestingly about Oyster Card, I used to have an Oyster Card that wasn't registered. I don't know if you can still not register an Oyster Card, but I was penalised for wanting to effectively be invisible but still be able to travel in that I had to pay more because I wasn't allowed to buy a monthly or annual Oyster uh, ticket, yeah. I had to pay a weekly ticket, which costs more. So that's what, what I would say one of the key examples is, A, if you don't want to be provide personal data or data to a, for a service, you should not be penalised. You should be able to receive exactly the same data, exactly the same service, uh, not more expensive, not restricted, uh, so if, if you choose to not provide personal data. Furthermore, examples where, we've heard a lot of examples of you can opt out from marketing. Um, but where we now learn, and of course opting out of CC, being caught up on CCTV means now basically not leaving your house, but so isn't actually functional. But for example, um, TfL's recent study that you published last week about uh, Wi-Fi collection, um, there's an awful lot from the publication that we're very supportive of. However, the signage that was put up that I saw didn't tell me that I needed to turn off my Wi-Fi, didn't tell me that I had the option to opt out, and that there was a way for me not to be picked up. You've since explained how that can be done. I would say that we need much more signage as we already have about you are now on CCTV put up everywhere. You are now being monitored via your Wi-Fi. Should you not wish to do this, please turn your Wi-Fi off. I think we need to move much, move much faster at not being, not, at being more transparent and open and not feeling irritated about the fact that some people might drop out and not be part of your data set, but that doesn't mean that your data set still can't provide benefits. Richard, do you want to respond to any of yes, this? Yeah, I, I should. Um, <laughs> You can still have an unregistered Oyster card, um, quite, but quite, quite definitely, but, but, you, but you're right, if, if you're going, I think, for a, a monthly or longer travel card, then, then we would say in your own interests, you, you do have to register it to protect the, the balance on, on to protect the product that you bought. Um, no, that, though, mate, yeah. Sorry, that yeah. is arguably my choice, yeah. that whether I want to protect it or yeah. not, but you've yeah. made that choice yeah. for me. Yeah, no, you, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And on the Wi-Fi pilot that, that was done before Christmas. Um, we, uh, we went to great efforts to explain how people could opt out. Just, it, I agree, it didn't actually appear on the posters, but there were, it was explained in articles in the Metro and on our website and uh, in emails to, to customers. Um, so, so there was plenty of information about how to opt out, but just not at that point when, when you walked into a station on a poster. It was a trial, it, it was four weeks, and, and we've very much taken on board what we needed to from, from that trial. And absolutely, we are going to look at reproducing the CCTV type signs that we've got on the tube stations at the moment, with signs that say Wi-Fi is being collected as, as well. Um, and how to... Yes, out. yes, it, yes, it, yes it, would, it would include that as, as well. Yeah, and, and we fully accept that people will want to opt out, and, and as you say, it, it, if, they, if they're out of the data set, then that's fair enough. It, it will still be a good data set. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So. Sean, do you want, sorry, um, just on the Wi-Fi issue, Sean, are there any issues? Because I know you had some casework, but you want to pursue on Wi-Fi now, or yes, do you want to wait? I can just, just yeah. do the Wi-Fi, and then we're bringing the other guest. Uh, come back to you, Navin. Yeah. The, the main question I had was about the whole posters issue. The fact that the posters. Um, said on them, go to a website to look up how to opt out instead of just go and turn off your Wi-Fi, which was the simplest possible instruction. Um, but um, can I ask about the data that you collected and how anonymous it was? That's, that's the main question that we have. Because you're collecting MAC addresses from everybody's Wi-Fi-enabled devices, which includes your phones, and then you're immediately anonymising that, turning it into a hash that, that's, ident that's unique but not... Yeah. The so positive is to track people really. through stations, yeah. isn't it? But, but yes, we were immediately converting it into a number that was not the MAC address number. Mm -hmm. um, 
and was a very complicated and long number and it was a unique number that uh, was irreversible so we couldn't go back to the MAC address uh, once we'd done that conversion um, and, and, and we can't do that now we've uh, th there was a key to it that was doing the scrambling we've thrown that away now uh, in effect um, so, so yes, it, it was uh, pr pretty much instantaneous uh, pseudonymization of the data. But isn't the point of it that when they pop up in another tube station, you, you know who they are again, because you're, you're able to tell what route they took through the network. This is, these are the lovely maps that yeah, you managed to yeah, choose. The, 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 so how, how, are they still anonymous if you're still able to see who match them to the same? We, we can't match that to an individual. But it is still... You can match it to the same phone in different places. It, we can tell it's a unique device, yeah. Okay. Because this is... My concern about this is that this is reversible data in the sense that the information the Commissioner was talking, talking about earlier on. These unique trips through the system and it's the same phone appearing in different places, potentially that's reversible, is it not? We don't think it's reversible to the extent that you can identify a person. If you know more about that person through another data set, possibly it is. And this is the question that the information commission it, it, had it's a, it's a risk that, w that we are aware of and that we paid a lot of attention to when we were doing our privacy impact assessment um, and when we were talking to the information commissioner's office uh, uh, about, about what the risks were mm -hmm. around, around the processing uh, that was I inherent in the trial. And it is something that we'll be thinking about a lot still uh, as, as we think about making it a permanent <coughs> thing. But, but we, we don't think that um, you, you can get to an identifiable individual from the data set that we're collecting. And I should say as well, of course, that we have absolutely no desire to get to it, uh, identify individuals from it. it you know, that's very far removed from, from why we're collecting, uh, why we would like to collect the data. No, I understand. I understand. I'm a, I used to be a transport campaigner, and this level of this kind of detail for transport planning purposes is really useful. Yeah. Can I ask the information commissioner just as a final thing? Are you content with the, the way this trial was carried out? Have you asked for any improvements? And do you have concerns about the re-identification of people? I think um, the TFL uh, Wi-Fi trial was a really good example of a public body coming forward with um, a plan, a new initiative, consulting us deeply doing a proper privacy impact assessment. I wasn't involved in it, but I know my staff gave a lot of, of feedback. It was very helpful. And uh, TFL responded to that, and we agreed with them that at least um, for now, in the one-way hash that they wanted to implement for the trial, and, and we, we agreed with them that it was not reversible and it was impossible at this point to identify or follow the the person through the various tube stations. So I think that's um, I would say it's a good example of um, privacy by design and good conversations with the regulator to try to get it right. So there's a lot of effort there. That's good, and you'll be keeping an eye on that in future. Of potential matching data. Yeah, we're, we're planning to continue the dialogue with, with the ICO. Okay. Okay. Back to you, Nadia. Yeah, yeah, I, I just wanted to get back to. Uh, have you, in terms of, uh, you know, having heard uh, the GLA uh, groups uh, about how they uh, sort of uh, manage uh, personal uh, uh, data, uh, I mean, what more or what else can they do to help a person, individuals to, you know, control their personal data? So, I mean, I will agree that in the case of the, um, the police, so as I, going back to the investigation I presented before of mm -hmm. um, state uh, punitive functions, it would be quite hard to operate purely on the basis of consent, but I think there is a lot uh, of room for more transparency and accountability. I mean, just the fact that you are listing now the type of data and agreements that you have instead of you having been able to look on the website before the meeting and find out. That, for example, is an, is an example. So I think that from that end, you know, from the police and MOPAC end, I think that definitely transparency and accountability, even if you cannot give people full control over their data, there's a lot of room. For other types of public services, I think that there is definitely a lot more room for a completely citizen-centric approach. I mean, when we look at the data, the data for London strategy, you know, what we saw was actually that, a, I mean, it's very clear a market-driven strategy, but when you look at the the theme of building public aware, uh, building public acceptance. I mean, the approach towards personal information in the strategy is set, is based around making people trust institutions so they will give you their data. 
And it's a, um, quite an instrumental view of privacy in the sense that you know, we are going to do something, hopefully it will be for your benefit, and now we are going to get you to trust us. Other cities like Barcelona are taking a much more citizen-centric approach, where they say, well, actually citizens are at the center of this, they own the data, and we are the stewards of the data. We are going to manage it for them, with them, rather than try to more or less, as it transpires, almost I don't want to be too disrespectful, almost like trick them into giving you the data. No? Let's see if they... So I think that in that sense, you know, um, there is a lot more to do. Um, when you look at things like integration, optimization, and behavioral change, I mean, again, you know, those are approaches where citizens almost like they are managed rather than co-producers of services. And I think that in that sense, you know, there is still a lot more room for giving citizens control of their information. In terms of specifics of the uh, specifics uh, that were in the, in the document, I think that the discussion around identification is important, but there is an added element that, I mean, I do agree with Renata that we should move towards that. There is a lot more room for opt-in and even an opt-out, if that's not possible, because when you need big data, it just has to be big enough. You don't need 100% of the people that pass from the station. You know, you just need to know that enough, and as long as your sample is not biased by the opt-in or the opt-out, you should be you should be able to give a lot more control to individuals. But there is a more important aspect almost nowadays, which is that even if people are not identified, they can still suffer consequences from the use of their data. And that is like there is a whole new field of group privacy um, in, in academy, in academia. And there there is things, for example, like the postcode mapping of the police or anything that involves uh, changes, for example, to the society of actuaries, uh, premium uh, insurance premiums when they use the data from hospital episodes. People, individuals, had their insurance premium changed, not because their individual data had been accessed, but because as a class, their conditions were now understood to be different. So their premium, so that kind of secondary effect is something that we generally escape the strict limit of the ICO, but again, going back to the need for a wider approach, particularly in the private sector, I think that it would be good to not just try to stick to what the letter of the law and data protection says, but try to look a bit wider what the implications of data are. And what you will find in many cases, particularly around the big data, is that there are effects there that escape the individual. And also what you will find is that public perception, in many cases, does not match the law, despite all the attempts to try to make people understand that once the data is anonymized, it's not their data, and they have absolutely no legal right to it people will still believe that is their data. I say, well, why is this company benefiting from my information? You know, why am they doing this? So I think that there is a lot of, uh, in that sense, to a point is true. I mean, from a strict data protection point of view, it's not their data, but from the point of view of value, creation is still their data. And that, is, uh, and that is quite a big trick, uh, a big issue. In terms of consent, uh, the, what we think is the most important question now, particularly with GDPR, is going to be revoking consent. Because everyone's been focused on how do you obtain consent, how do you give people the best information possible. But the big challenge is that with particular GDPR, people should be able to revoke their consent. So if you're operating on a consent basis, you need to have very clear mechanisms for the revoking, revocation of consent and also the set of consequences that that implies, which could be the deletion of data. And I think that, again, probably not for the MPS, you know, but for other, some of the other public bodies. Uh, being able to implement those mechanisms is going to be quite a challenge, and I think that's something that I should be looking at now in terms of GDPR. Okay, let's move on to the issues of security. Keith Prince. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first question to the Information Commissioner, if I may. Uh, yeah. What are the key security risks for the public sector around personal data, both in terms of internal and external threats? Well, I think I think the biggest risk is people, but that's also the biggest solution. So you know, you can have a very very strong um, network security system where the software is being updated. There's good training on password, but the system's only as good as the weakest link. So again, you know, training and awareness, and um, it's it's just so very important. And I think. Part of the problem is everybody's focusing on big cyber hacks and criminal actions, and that's where the newspaper headings are going. But I can tell you that 95% of the data breaches that are reported to the ICO are low tech, and they're not criminal hacks, and they're completely preventable through training and up-to-date software and clear roles and responsibilities and evergreen IT security practices. 
I think um, legacy databases, which are an issue in the public sector, um, as we saw with the NHS ransomware attack, you know, that's just not keeping up with the patchwork management. So, I mean, it's, it's those lower tech problems that are creating most of the security risks and the security gaps. And that's frustrating, I think, for everybody. The good news is that, and I would add another um, security risk, and that is um, devices taken outside of the network, you know, use your own device uh, policies, there, there are issues with that. Um, I think that the GDPR, because it is the gold standard um, for data protection legislation, is going to incentivize better practice and more um, implementation of good practice as well as more investment in security. And I think that's a great thing for the public sector because the law has um, more significant fines and, and sanctions for um, gaps in security that end in compromise for citizens. And what we have to remember, and I go back to what Renata said earlier, is it's really the new law and data protection is really all about people. So it's really focusing on people, the people whose data is, get, it, is compromised or is vulnerable, but also people can create a better and more safer environment to secure um, public sector and private sector data. That's very helpful, thank you. Our uh, next question is to TfL, MOPAC, GLA. Might as well be in that, that order, actually. Um, what is the most significant data loss you've suffered in the last few years, and how did you respond to it? We'll look to the TfL first of all. Um, we have had a, a, a small number of data breaches uh, over the years. Um, just to add to, to what Ms. Denham was saying uh, about the lower tech uh, end of the, of the threat spectrum, I, th I think my example probably actually relates to a, to a breach involving paper, um, which, which certainly at the time TfL did still have some of, um, and, and it involved uh, Oyster application forms, which, which uh, was a paper-based process for, for that particular uh, product, and, um, and some, some forms, quite, quite a large number of forms, were unaccounted for uh, in, in transit between um, post offices and our service provider and ourselves. Um, and that was an issue that we reported to the ICO um, and, and that we um, took action as a result of, obviously, um, and, and investigated and followed through and, and changed some processes. And it's now, it's now an online secure process, um, partly as a result of that incident. Um, that the incident, the breach, didn't result in any enforcement action being taken against us because of the steps we, we took to mitigate uh, the consequences at the time. Did you find them? We, we never found them. No. Okay, thank you. Um, Mopat. So, as befitting, we've got quite a small organisation, and you wouldn't be surprised that there hasn't been that many. There's only one that we're aware of back in 2015, um, at which it was uh, informed to the uh, Information Commissioner's Office and uh, it was to do with a personal uh, data breach of a, an individual um, and uh, it was kind of then dealt with uh, as a, a training and um, uh, kind of, um, a personnel issue uh, in, t in terms of how we operate at Smoopat. Tom? Oh, sorry. Tom? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's similar, it's, it's, it's case papers, um, theft from a pub um, uh, where an officer had, had taken papers out um, and called in on the pub on the way, on the way home. Um, it was a classic sort of bag theft, um, but the officer was, uh, was, was dealt with uh, through disciplinary measures because he shouldn't have, 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 have done what, what he did. Um, and it was reported to, to the Information Commissioner's Office, but it, again, it, it just reinforces that it's the human, the human element. Um, put all the uh, technical measures you, you, you like in place, um, but you've got to address, address the behaviour. Um, 
and, that, and that's 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 the challenge. Um, you know, people do do things that they they realise afterwards that they, they should not have done. And in some respects, no amount of training changes that. Um, so you've got to reinforce that with you know um, ongoing awareness and and the appropriate sanctions when when that goes wrong. Yeah, we've we've had one uh, notifiable breach to, uh, which we reported to the ICO, which was the I mentioned the housing moves uh, database earlier, um, where in response to an FIR request, uh, unfortunately someone sent out an Excel spreadsheet that uh, contained uh, plus information, which was obviously deeply regrettable as um, as far as we're aware. Uh, the one person who received that response, as far as we're aware deleted it and not had anything serious, no enforcement action taken as a result, uh, given, the, given the steps we, take, we, we took. Um, we actually, speaking about Excel spreadsheets, we have found quite often not just about personal data, but uh, just kind of like data beyond what people have asked for. You be very careful with tabs and spreadsheet and forming on a spreadsheet because it, it can, you can very easily, you think you're being helpful by giving people Excel spreadsheets, but you, you, you can open up a whole world of pain doing that and that's beyond personal data, that's just kind of any, any sort of data. Uh, so that, that's that's one we've had, as far as we're aware, no damage was done, and a bit like uh, the colleagues, it was regarded as a training issue for colleagues in housing and land. Thank you. Um, Again, to say all four of you, how significant are external threats to your security systems, and where do these threats come from? Start again, but. Sorry, starting with me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I think there there are obviously just from from what you read in the in the press, and, and uh, there there are obvious external security threats, cyber threats to to to, to anyone running. Uh, services that are dependent on digital systems. Um, we do see evidence of, of, of that in, in attacks on, on TfL's network. Um, uh, that they are picked up and blocked. And I couldn't say where they where they come from. Um, I don't know if that's known in a lot of instances, but 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 I I, I don't know where they where they come from, or what the re what the motivation is. But but one only can presuppose. In terms of MOPAC, um, we have two sets of data systems coming in. Uh, the majority of our correspondence is dealt with through a, a contract with the GLA. So the, um, the GLA runs the, the, the IT system uh, for most of our work. But then in terms of our um, secret and top secret and um, kind of wider uh, MET work, we also have aware terminals in, in our um, building for accessing MET, MET systems, which of course is, is run by the MET. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it, in terms of cyber, it's sort of foreign state and organised crime uh, are the two with the most capability. Um, we uh, defend against that's that's our defence posture is, is to protect against against that. Um, I wouldn't say in reality, but I, you know the, the greatest risk is, is someone clicking on a email link that they should not do so. Um, uh, assuming all the right measures are in on the, on the infrastructure, um, and that's that's a behaviour culture thing which you know, we regularly brief staff on uh, through through awareness the initiatives. Um, as Paul says, I mean we've got our own infrastructure which which we extend out. Um, that is regularly checked um, for a health check. Um, to ensure it's you know, it's got the right defences to protect banks than their risks. Thank you. So it does beg the question. So have we ever lost any data from an external threat? We had an attack on the Cycle Hire website uh, last year, which, um, we, as far as we could establish, it was a, a, a criminal. Actually, not a very organised criminal. It was an individual loan act. Um, penetrated the site for hire website and certainly accessed some uh, data about customers and, and we think took some data. And the outcome of investigations presumably? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, we, we took all the steps that we needed to do to, to, to manage the incident uh, and to, to <coughs> audit, audit what might have happened. Um, we contacted the affected customers, we offered them um, 
credit protection service and that kind of thing and separately the police investigated the actual attack and somebody was successfully prosecuted okay so so chair I, I, I don't think the GLA has lost as far as I'm aware any personal data result of that but I think I think what you probably recall is I think once our website was successfully hacked and sort of made to look different and say strange things but with no personal data <coughs> okay. thank you John. Uh, yeah, just finally then, really, um, to the four of you. How would you decide when and how to inform individuals about a potential data loss? Um, the Information Commissioner has some helpful guidance right. that, uh, that um, explains what the current position is in, in UK legislation, because we're not under any obligation to inform affected customers, oh, right. um, but there, as you'd expect, it, 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 is, um, it is something that we, we would want to do in certain cases, and so there's a set of criteria that, that the Information Commissioner, as I say, has, has published, that is what we uh, benchmark against <coughs> if, if we're looking at an incident, and it's around the type of data that, that's been affected and the number of people that have been affected. And, and the, the use that might be put, put um, that it might be put to in the wrong hands. It's sort of an, an exercise that we go through to, to weigh all of that up internally. Um, so, I mean, the question was, how would you decide? And just wondering, who makes that decision to contact affected people? In, internally, that, that's been a decision that has been made at the highest level when we've referred it up uh, within the organisation. Okay, thank you. Paul? Cool. Um, so, in the 2015 incident that I mentioned, uh, we were able to identify who um, was the subject um, and were able to write to him and, and issue a formal apology. Um, in terms of uh, the, the process more generally, um, as, as Richard said, there are kind of good um, tools uh, available for making that sort of decision and it would be the Chief Executive of, of MOFAC that would make that decision. Yes, I mean, again, we would follow the same, same criteria in, in terms of notifying the individual, it's, it's the level of risk that, that that presents to that individual, so you know, informing them so that they can take appropriate steps to protect themselves. Uh, in terms of whether uh, who would make that decision, we would, in uh, a breach of that nature, create a goal group, um, and it would be the senior officer in response, uh, responsible for that goal group on the advice of, of, of myself or my team uh, from the data protection side. Um, and then the senior information risk owner, which is at an assistant commissioner level, would be the, the route for which a notification would go to the uh, information commissioner's office staff as well. Thank you. Very similar to the others, and the ICO guidance is obviously very helpful, um, and uh, we take the decision by our uh, director of resources here, who's our, our nominated senior lead. Just quickly to the uh, Information Commission, it was, it was interesting that uh, Richard said there's no legal obligation to, to notify people. Uh, what is your advice, though, on that sort of thing? Well, the good news is that the law is changing, so there will be a mandatory duty to report um, significant risks, breaches that could result in significant risks to the rights of individuals will be mandatory as of May 25th, 2018. So all public bodies will be required to report to the commissioner's office. And also, if there is a high risk to individuals, to those affected, notification to those affected individuals. So there will be a requirement yeah. and also a time limit. So the commissioner's office needs to be informed within 72 hours mm -hmm. of a breach. And I think there's a very strong public policy purpose behind that provision it's not about punishing organizations or playing gotcha. It's really about the public knowing that a regulator has their back and the regulator can take action if my office feels that notification should have been made to individuals and it was not, then we have sanctions and powers to take action. So this is a whole new regime that's coming into force um, in 2018. You say there's a time limit by which the organisation must notify you, 72 hours of uh, Is there uh, equally a time limit by which they have a duty to inform the victim? If you like? 
think that the the, um, the duty to inform the the vict victim is within a reasonable time period. So I mean that's that's well, where the devil's in the details. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, in some cases, there can be a breach, and maybe there's examples here that the organizations can give you where they know there's been a breach, but they're not clear which data has been lost yeah. and whether or not it's recoverable, et cetera, et cetera. So within 72 hours, there may not be all of the information necessary to carry out notification, but if there is, then as soon as practicable <coughs> would be our advice and we're going to be issuing new guidance about the thresholds for notifying individuals and reporting to our office. So just to respond, so will you be giving some kind of a guideline then as to what you believe reasonable to mean because reasonable is not definitive and as I said lawyers make a lot of money out of the word reasonable whereas if you could give them some guidance here we've been this instance is X number of days, that instance Y number of days. So obviously I appreciate the, lo the oyster paperwork that was lost, you wouldn't know who was on a piece of paper, would you? You wouldn't. You might not, and that's, that's part of the problem. But we, we will be issuing guidance. It needs to be pan-European guidance because it's coming out of the GDPR. So we have to get agreement among all of my counterparts across Europe, and the guideline on data, data breach notification will be coming out in December. Um, on top of that, the ICO will will give more detail to organizations because it seems to be one of the areas of the new law that's requiring um, a lot of clarification. But uh, what my message is, you know, tell it all, tell it fast, tell the truth, mm -hmm. get it out there, um, identify people because it really is about also our ability to collect trends and to be able to give advice to all organizations sure. across sectors about how to protect themselves because these are the ten top risks that you're going yeah. to face. So there's a, there's a really good public policy reason for this provision in, uh, in the GDPR. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Should we move on to um, future personal data then and legislation? So over to Peter Whittle. Yeah. Um, it's a question for Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, I think you've sort of already touched on some things, but um, can you say how will Brexit um, and the introduction of the GDPR affect how personal data should be protest, processed? Well, GDPR, as I said, is, is probably the, the gold standard regulation um, around the world right now, and there's going to be lots of countries that are, that are going to imitate it, which is a good thing. So we've waited a long time for new data protection legislation, and I would say it has taken much, much too long because it's a generation behind the beginning of um, the beginning of the internet. Yeah. So um, the law is strong. The GDPR will have direct effect in the UK, and also the government has committed and now has the bill that brings in the implementation of that regulation into UK law. That was in the uh, Queen's speech most recently, right? Exactly, and now the bill has been introduced in Parliament. So, as well as the law enforcement directive, which is, I know that the law enforcement community was waiting with bated breath for that. So there's going to be a comprehensive law that brings in these standards into UK law. I think that's a very good thing. Your question is, how does Brexit impact that? Mm -hmm. We're going to have those standards which are essentially equivalent to the EU standards in our national law. That's a good thing. But we may lose the ability to um, participate in the pan-European system, which is um, something that I think would have been a positive thing for the UK, especially around um, uh, international policing, crime, anti-terrorism. I mean, the closer we are to Europe on, on that sense, I think the better it is. But our laws will be essentially equivalent to the EU and the highest gold standard um, around the world, which is very positive. Thank you for, for that. Uh, could I ask, uh, actually, Richard and Paul, uh, what plans you've got uh, in place, if any, to implement the GDPR? We, we have got plans. Um, we've been closely following uh, the drafting, the debate around the GDPR, 
uh, ever since the off, really. Um, so we we are well prepared in terms of knowing what we've got to do. Yeah. Um, the bill uh, will will fill in those gaps that we still have, the questions that we still had about how some of the details in the GDPR will be implemented in the UK, for instance. Um, um, and so we, we, we've had long enough to, to identify that there is actually quite a lot to do to, to uh, be ready for May next year. And now we are working through our plans to, to, to do that at a very sort of practical ground, uh, on the ground, cha changing privacy notices that c customers are exposed to, uh, identifying all the, all the things that need to be updated on our website, um, the contractual changes that we need to make with, with um, uh, our outsourced suppliers. Um, uh, mapping where we hold personal data in the organisation and, and making sure we fulfil all of the um, fulfil all of the accountability requirements that, that are in the GDPR and that are perhaps the, the single biggest element that's changing for us. Um, but yeah, we're, we have a programme of work and we're working through it. You're up to speed. Is it pretty much the same for you, Paul? It is in terms of the operation of Mopac as an organisation. What I would touch on also is. Um, the Met's Office Police and Crimes role as an oversight body of the Met. So uh, we're pushing out from three levels, uh, official, um, for, uh, formal and then audit and assurance. Uh, at official level, I, I sit on the Met's uh, Risk Insurance Board, uh, of which information governance is, is, is one of the risks. Um, and at, at kind of a formal level, the um, Deputy Mayor has a um, regular oversight board of the Met, uh, of, of which this is a, a topic of discussion, of course. And thirdly, uh, at, at an audit level, uh, both of both of our organisations, but the whole GLA is uh, subject to the Directorate of Audit and Insurance, and they produce reports to the uh, Independent Audit Panel, again, which is uh, will be scrutinising our progress towards us. Um, thank you. Uh, Tom, well, you know, is this the same story for you? I mean, I was, I was also wondering, you know, whether the Mayor has commissioned any work on any changes that might be between the flow of information between uh, uh, the GLA and the EU, for example? I mean, we've, we've, we're very much in the, uh, in the same, the same position as the others. We, we, we've kind of done a, a comprehensive survey of all the sort of personal data we hold and, and what steps we need to take uh, to um, um, comply with GDPR uh, as, as, as it's coming in. Um, Following to the Paul mentioned audit and, and your with your other hat on, it, it strikes me it might make sense that you you'd you'd want to ask uh, our friends in audit to have a look at that and reassure you as chair of the audit panel that we're doing what we say we're doing. So that's probably something we should add to the uh, add to the work program. Um, in terms of GLA data flow with the EU, I'm not particularly aware of what that might be. But um, should there be more work done by the mayor on this? Not that, not that I'm aware of, but if people want to suggest things, then mm. please do so. Just so the, there's been no work commission done to the impact, as it were, of, of, of our leaving the EU on the flow of data? I'm not, I'm not aware of anything. Okay. I'm not quite aware what the angle would be on that, but the, I'm, not, I'm not aware of anything. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, let's then move on to, uh, we're doing the final stretch for our guests as well as the Assembly members. So we're going back to Sean. Okay, um, I'll do this as quickly as I can because I know we've got another whole section um, to do. Um, it seems to me like the, the GDPR is an opportunity to review all our practices and spot and find any, any gaps there might be. Um, so I've got a few questions about sort of new technologies that are coming in. It seems to me like Partly, I mean, we, we're doing new tech, sometimes we're doing it right from the start, and I've been asking questions about data and body-worn video, because that's just come into the, to the Met. Police now have a camera on them, a lot of data is being recorded. And it's not so much the, the sort of crime, recording what happens when there's crimes aspect that I've been worrying about, it's more what happens to data that you don't need to keep, how long do you keep it for, and all those kinds of things. And for body-worn video, the answers have come back quite reassuringly that you know it automatically deletes after 30 days unless it's flagged or 31 days sorry yes unless it's flagged um, and you know we're reasonably content with the policies that have been done for body worn video um, the other thing that's been in the news and, and caught the eye of people in terms of data has been facial recognition technology 
Um, and from what the Biometrics Commissioner said today, if I can ask the Information Commissioner, it seems to fall a bit between you, the Biometrics Commissioner, and the CCTV Commissioner, who all have sort of overlapping interests in facial recognition. <coughs> Is there, is there, I mean, is, is this why it's difficult to know what the policy is for facial recognition? Because there's nobody sort of making it. Can you maybe fill us in on what your thoughts are on this? <coughs> there are a lot of commissioners working in this space. Yes. So it's a crowded <laughs> space. Do you, do you speak to each other? So we do speak to each other. And yes, isn't that a wonderful thing? In fact, I think I'm, I'm meeting with the uh, CCC, CTTV um, commissioner next week. Um, and I've met with the biometrics commissioner and I share his concerns that were expressed in his annual report. We had a meeting on that. Again, he has a very specific mandate. My remit is very broad. It's data protection across the public sector, across the private sector, across the third sector. So we're not a technology specific regulator, but at the end of the day, we do regulate in this space. So if there was a complaint, it would, it would come to our office. So the biometrics commissioner is writing reports and making recommendations and um, raising issues. Uh, that's the same with the CCTV commissioner, the, sur the camera surveillance commissioner, doesn't have regulatory powers to take action. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a, a raising awareness and, and critique of public policy. Mm -hmm. So I think we work together, but we deal with all technologies across all sectors all the time. So we have a very broad remit. And, um, but I have deep respect for the work that the Biometrics Commissioner is doing, and I agree with his concerns on facial recognition. OK, so but ultimately, you'll be the one who might put guidelines <coughs> out, or, or if, we, if we come to any sort of conclusions here, yeah. we might write to you. That's really useful to know. Could I ask the, the Met Police about this, therefore? Yeah, um, this is being sort of, it's been announced twice now, in two years in a row, that it's going to be used at Notting Hill. Um, but we have quite little information about what's being, what information has been kept. And I've put in about 20 written mail questions about this, about various aspects. Can you, can you tell us sort of roughly how you, what sort of a data protection approach you're taking to the, the information captured? What sort of protection approach you're taking to the database? Every time I ask about the database, it seems to be the same size. This doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and just, are you planning any sort of consultation or public publish any guidelines about how you're using it? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the trial, and it is still a trial, yeah. has been used at the two most recent Notting Hill carnivals. Um, a small subset of data has been used um, as that. Um, piece to, to monitor images of people coming through against uh, and that's of known wanted individuals and those with um, um, bail conditions not to enter the carnival area. Um, so that's, that sample is drawn from a wider database and that's, I have to imagine that's the one you're referring to, the, the size of it was 2.9 million records. Um, of, of custody, uh, our custody images. Um, that's the source. Um, the, the images on uh, the facial recognition database used for Carnival, that's just kept at the moment for um, three months for analysis purposes, as per, for the purpose of the trial. And, but it will be 31 days, the same as, as body worn video, if and when it is used and you know, it moves into operational service at the moment, it is just a trial. The reason I think it's, it's a trial still is that we haven't been able to deploy it elsewhere uh, in any meaningful way um, and, and there are certain conditions under which at the moment that, that camera system works um, and, and finding the right place to try it further um, is part of the trial. The intention is that that concludes the end of this year. Okay, so, so all the images are kept, even if they're not matched, but only for both three, three months. Three, just, just, it's the reads, yes, yeah. um, just to prove the technology. Okay, that, that's yeah, that's it's not, yeah, it's not. It's that those images are not used for any other purpose at the moment. They're so. not put onto the database or anything no, like no, that. No, no, The database comes from custody images. Yes. Still, yes, useful to know. Um, in terms of. 
drones <laughs> also in the news and helicopter footage if I can muddle those two in um, it appears to me that the helicopter footage which is kept by the police aviation service which is a central service the policy on how long they keep it for seems to come from each individual force that they're capturing the data on behalf of it appears they're keeping all the met images for seven years and that that might be one of those policies that's been like overlooked that you've not put a policy together for removing those images. I'm not cited or aware of that. This is um, what we heard yeah, and will, we've checked will, that. Okay, I will. Because that seems to me like um, there's a gap because yes. there's no way you need to keep that information for seven years. No. No. <laughs> well, I'll say no, but I mean, I... Except if this flag doesn't need to yeah, yeah, evidence. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much like statute of limitations periods and, and, and things like that, so it's a legal mm. hold, um, which on, on individual cases, I can imagine, that's right, but not on all gathered, all, all material gathered. That's right. It seems I'll, like there may I'll, not I'll be re no policy. I'll review that one. I'll get back to you. And on drones, presumably, because this is new technology, you're taking a more robust approach yes. to planning for data protection. Yes, I know. No, that's going to approve the impact assessment process at the moment. Uh, it's an eight-week trial, which has just started, um, and we are initially using the same um, measures as body worn video. So it'll be 31 days unless it's operationally, ne uh, operationally or necessary for uh, um, criminal proceedings. And are you planning any public consultation on any That'll of these new technologies? That will be part of, of, of it. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, Transport for London. Can I... Okay. Will you also be providing the Police and Crime Committee the evaluation of the trials? Is that MOPAC's role in the oversight arrangements or is that the MPS role? Or either of you, can you make a note and can we just agree that? We'll get back to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> can I ask Transport for London whether there's any, been any requests, any consideration of using facial recognition on any of Transport for London's cameras? or on the network at all? Uh, we've got no plans to use any facial recognition on any, in connection with any service. And if there was, you would tell the public before this happened? Yes. If there was, we, we, we would start from very first principles and, and, and make sure that we did a really good uh, data protection impact assessment on it, and part of that would be telling the public and consulting the public. <coughs> um, just briefly, because I know we haven't asked the campaigners anything for a while, is there anything you want to add on, on new technologies or these new the facial recognition issue particularly. Um, please. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, we've just published a report about use of body-worn video by police forces across the country, and we raise extreme concern about the fact that not one police force nor the CPS could tell us how often footage from body-worn videos have been used to secure or otherwise a conviction. We think that's a huge problem. We think if you're going to use this technology, and um, there have already been plenty of questions asked by police forces uh, uh, within their own trials about whether the technology is, is proving to do all the things that we've been promised, uh, you should publish how often, not just body-worn video, but how often CCTV or any other surveillance camera footage is used in, in convicting an individual. That would be helpful to see for transparency purposes, which as I know is one of the reasons why you've rolled out body-worn video. Same goes also for local authorities using body-worn video. It would be very helpful to actually be able to see how, why, when. And, body -worn, and local authorities retain body-worn video footage for much longer than 31 days in some cases. So that's worth looking at further. And we have two reports on the Big Brother Watch website you can look at about that. With regards to facial recognition technology, we are profoundly concerned about what is going on. And we've just released a campaign called Face Off, calling for, just as the, uh, just as the, forgive me, the Biometrics Commissioner called for in his report yesterday, the automatic deletion of innocent people, that's unconvicted people, custody images, and subsequent facial biometrics that have been made, which we now know, thanks to yesterday's annual report of the Biometrics Commissioner, is over 16.5 million images. Um, if you are innocent, you should be not be held on a database. Your DNA and your fingerprints are automatic, automatically deleted uh, thanks to the Protection of Freedoms Act. But the government who were required to respond to the retention of custody images took five years to respond to the High Court and then came back saying, well, they're actually quite helpful. We don't think your face is that sensitive. We suggest that people write and request removal, and the police, uh, it's at the police's discretion as to whether that's going to happen further. We think that's unacceptable. We'd like to see Home Office policy change, legislation change, so the automatic deletion of innocent people's photos, it, it now becomes law. 
Um, with regards to the use of uh, the trial of uh, technology at Notting Hill, uh, just to put on the record, Big Brother Watch were uh, consulted about that with one meeting last year. We've had no further consultation with the Metropolitan Police. We saw no findings of the trial last year. We were not told in advance of this year's trial. And uh, we um, certainly object to any indication in the press that we signed off on this or gave our approval. It's not for an organisation such as Big Brother Watch to do that. It is for Parliament. We are waiting still, final point, that the Home Office have promised for almost five years publication of their biometric strategy. That has not happened. We therefore don't have any oversight, legislation, regulation or scrutiny of any of the biometric technologies, namely facial recognition going ahead, yet we do know that the Home Office are calling uh, our offering investment of over £5 million for the creation of facial recognition technologies by police forces across the country. We think this needs to be addressed urgently. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is little to, to add if I or not. I think that you will find that uh, pretty much most uh, civil liberties and technology groups in the UK right now would agree with the analysis and actually are preparing to mobilize. We did run a small campaign at the time of Notting Hill ourselves. In terms of uh, what else could be said is that um, actually there are, apart from being a really expensive technology and something that has I mean, as a public expenditure, something that should be uh, submitted to some evidence that it works, mm -hmm. There are, uh, the evidence from the US is actually that um, it's quite mixed, and I think it would be important to understand, you know, actually how much of this works. Particularly, there are concerns around racial discrimination, both in the over-representation of um, ethnic minorities in police databases, and actually on the capacity of the technology to identify non-white faces. So those things, I think, that definitely should be should be addressed. Um, I mean, the concept in um, US researchers are describing the widespread use of facial recognition as the perpetual lineup, where every single person that walks down the street is now put in the lineup, you know, like that you are made to walk and one person in the line is the potential criminal and everyone else is innocent. And I think that the understanding is that now, basically, as we walk down the street, we are all going to be in a perpetual lineup. And we find that uh, deeply disturbing. The other area of technology you know, here, and where we also have some concerns, uh, it would be uh, road pricing. And I don't know if you were planning to discuss it here, you know, but there is, uh, but we, I mean, we obviously, I think pretty much everyone right now shares the um, concerns both about the traffic, pollution, the amount of traffic in the streets, but we, we looked at the London Stolian report from the assembly and what we found is that there is very little detail on how it could work and very little detail, particularly when it comes to privacy and civil liberties, which is actually literally one line at the bottom saying that the integration should be looked at. I think that this is one of the areas where if you can make it work, it would be amazing to make it work without tracking every single car in London is going to be incredibly difficult. And I think that the privacy and civil liberties concern should be a much, much larger part of, the, of any report or work on this area. And I think that, for some, I mean, in terms of uh, there are, there are some ideas being proposed, like extensive use or more sophisticated use of AMPR, uh, you know, with differential pricing and things like that would not involve tracking every single car uh, through GPS. But ultimately, the, it seems that the, the end game would be individual tracking, making that, of course, would be quite, quite difficult to you know, make compatible with civil liberties. I mean, it may work you know, at some point, but, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's going to be hard. No, I, I, I mean, yeah, I'd like to say as a former transport campaign, I'm aware, I'm aware the last time road pricing was talked yeah. about, this was one of the key public yeah. objections, it is one of the key yeah. risks to doing it, yeah. and with the GDPR in place, potentially mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, to make those two things yeah. match up. So TfL, have you, you got anything to say yeah. about yeah. how you're planning to do that? If I could come in there, um, we are very conscious that my team will need to put a lot of privacy input in, in, into thinking as it develops around road pricing. Um, the, the fact that, that privacy is, is a huge concern uh, around road pricing schemes as, as they have operated in the past mm -hmm. it, it is obviously very well recognised and accepted within TfL and we will need to work through what the GDPR means um, and, and look at it in, in, in a different way I think. And, and be very open about how, how we develop our thinking on that. So if I may say, I think that for us, the, in a case like this, um, you need to go beyond policies. I mean, I think that with all the respect to the Metropolitan Police, I just think, 
we would find it very hard to believe that once that data is created, it will not be accessed for other purposes other than tracking the thing that you will need to really bake into the technology. Yeah. Yeah. A systems that would make almost like irreversible, then that would come at the cost, of course, you know, because then someone would say, oh, you know, those, here's the terrorists that did this and we weren't able to catch them because the you know, data was encrypted. And I think, but I think that the decision will have to be made that at some point you're going to have a loss of utility on the data. Yeah if you want to protect privacy, but I think that to say that you're going to go ahead and promise that you, you know, you're going to protect the data from other secondary uses five years down the line, I think that no one working in this sector would believe that the protections will remain in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, last set of questions over to Onka Safota. Yeah, I think this is sort of summing up on what we've heard this afternoon. These questions are predominantly at uh, Big Brother, uh, sorry, Big, Big Brother Watch and also to the Commissioner and also to uh, the Open Rights Group. Um, is there anything that you've heard this afternoon that concerns you or that you feel that you're glad you heard it? <laughs> Let's start with you. Um, I, I just come back to the point that we, we don't understand what, our, what data is, really. We, we think we do, but we don't. And talk about general data uh, as I've already said, often, more often than not now, means, means personal data or data that, that can be used to identify people in some way or their movements. Whilst I'm, I, I'm, um, I'm very pleased with the, the, the work that has been done by TfL in relation to the Wi-Fi scheme and the, the genuine attempts to bake in privacy, privacy by design, as, as, uh, as Elizabeth Denham mentioned, uh, and the, the approach to informing the public. Um, it's, a, it's a good start, and it's a start that I would really recommend that everybody take uh, something from, particularly with regards to the uh, Data for London strategy. It is the absolute, from my point of view, polar opposite of the Data for London strategy, which is, frankly, incredibly poor and merely tips its hat at the idea of privacy and has no mention of security. Um, overall, I think this has been a really helpful session. Um, I, um, I hope you listen to what everybody has said and certainly inform yourself more about the GDPR and the impact and the positive impact yeah. that data protection has on all UK citizens before and after Brexit. Thank you. Yeah, I think that it has been very useful and you know, also helped uh, to understand actually a lot more how the TFL and NPS work and the um, in the processes, I think for us, uh, things that we would say, going back to some of the points I made before, um, we would stress the need to go beyond strict data protection, mm -hmm. but for a public body, for scrutiny and uh, elected members of, um, of the assembly to look at what the wider ethical issues around data, what are the impacts of the policies and how data plays there, rather than just looking at strictly whether data protection is breached or not, important as that is. You know, I think that we are looking at you know the use of, um, the impact of data in society nowadays goes uh, beyond the strict breaches or the negative aspects. And we will look at ethics that go beyond the principle of doing no harm, but actually using data in a positive way to actually do good rather than just uh, don't do bad things. Second thing is that um, we find, again, you know, going back to what Renato was saying, there is a data protection in GDPR. It's got this principle of data protection by design. And one strong element there is minimization, mm -hmm. data minimization. And we, uh, we talk about the minimum viable data. And I think that in many cases, what we find is that the opposite approach is taken. So I say, let's see how much data we can get. And later on, we'll see what can be done with it. And we think that the, um, the principle should be the opposite. And actually, the law says that the principle should be the opposite. And I should see, do we really need this data? If we don't need it, you know, there's not. Let's not use it. And the final point, going back again to the um, data strategy, uh, we also found it quite poor. The uh, strategy theme four around public acceptance was, I mean, contained almost no real actions. It was all relying on external external support uh, for data protection, whether it's the London Catapult or um, the Royal Society. And we think that the, um, I mean, London needs a much stronger uh, force of privacy. I mean, we need a data protection officer, but not just a person or a tick box and exercise to comply with GDPR, but to start embedding privacy and data protection into the processes in a much stronger way than what is there. Thank you. And Commissioner? Yeah. Um, I can, I can echo, echo some of those thoughts. I think that um, data protection is not a tick box kind of exercise. And if GDPR is read properly, then it's about three things. It's about transparency, and that connects you with the trust that citizens have 
in your organization. It's about more control for individuals so that they can take back agency when it comes to the use of personal information. And lastly, and I think one of my colleagues said this around the table, the biggest change in the GDPR is around accountability. And what that means is there's got to be structure and roles and responsibility and tracking your data, knowing where your data is, privacy by design, mandatory data um, protection impact assessments, mandatory reporting. All this is about gaining the trust of citizens and customers in organizations that process their data. And this used to be, this discussion that we're having today, 10 years ago, backroom issue. Mm -hmm. Today, it's front page, front line issue, and if you want to have, put the law aside, um, if you want to have the social license to continue to use data, then you've got to, you've got to demonstrate that to, to citizens because it's really easy to lose trust with shiny new technologies and I think the growing appetite for big data. So I think the GDPR and the focus that it provides means that this is a chance to change the culture in the organization and get this right. And that's going to give you the ability to say you've got the trust and show you're doing, say what you're going to do, do what you say, and then be prepared to demonstrate it. And that's, that's really what the GDPR is all about. So. Thank you very much for inviting me to the discussion today. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And just the last question before before we to go is what opportunities and risks should the assembly be aware of um, over the next few years? What, what sort of things can we as scrutiny um, elected officials be, should be aware of, right, on behalf of Londoners? So first off, um, somebody mentioned who's the data protection officer. There will need to be a data protection officer, so you have to make sure that that person's in place. What's the governance for data protection in organizations that you, are, you oversee, mm -hmm. and this committee in particular? What about audits? What about data protection audits? Is there a plan for them? Are you going to see them? So I think you want to see um, the progress that's being made on data protection implementation because at the end of the day it's all about the citizen. That's what it's about and that's your role as legislators. Did you want to yeah, I think um, just maybe a couple of um, addition um, after agreeing with uh, everything the staff said. Um, there's also the, um, in the UK the, um, the Digital Economy Act will create new powers for data sharing mm -hmm. that will obviously give an, an opportunity as it was designed to minimize some of the friction involved in creating new data sharing agreements. Um, some of the functions of the Metropolitan Police would be completely outside of the, of the Digital Economy Act, but when it comes to public services, they would be, they will, it will be easier to create some data sharing agreements to share data. Now, obviously, that also creates risk and something that we would we want to understand a bit more is how the new powers mm -hmm. uh, will work with some, some areas of GDPR which force the, any legislation that allows data sharing to be a lot more detailed than it was until now. So we think that, again, it is an opportunity, uh, but it's also a risk of any new data agreements. Even if, they, if it looks that it's easier to put them in place right now, they still need to have safeguards. They still need to be limited, proportionate. You know, we would see also like time limited. So that would be an important thing. Then in terms of um, technologies, I think you've covered uh, some of the discussions, but I think we, everything we've seen now uh, will continue to accelerate. I mean, something that we're seeing with concern, for example, some of the centralization of data. We look at how Camden uh, has built this uh, citizen index, where basically they just matched. They build a one single database where every single, all the information from all the residents is put in one single system. That um, raises concerns, both from the point of view of security, but also from the point of view of privacy more broadly, despite the assurances as to the limitations in, the, in terms of access control. But we think that uh, any idea about centralizing data and building big data systems uh, will be, I mean, will create new risks, and we think they should be examined quite carefully. Thank you. And David? Um, we, 
uh, uh, to reiterate something I've, I've said repeatedly, we have to understand that protecting the citizen isn't just protecting our physical well-being, it's protecting our data, be that by installing and properly not breaking or undermining encryption, uh, ensuring that policing for the 21st century isn't a case of investing lots of money in technology that actually isn't proven to be of any great value. I mean, don't forget, we were promised that CCTV would remove crime from our streets. It hasn't done that. It has become a tool to investigate crime that has already happened. And whilst that brings great value, don't make promises that don't stand up. And if the promises change, be open and honest about them. Um, but also we need to be very aware that big data is not the solution to everybody's problem. Good data is very helpful. Accurate data and minimal data often will help you provide greater solutions than hoovering up everything. So uh, of all the things that, um, uh, uh, in summary, really, that is a case of, as, as, as Elizabeth said, uh, protecting the citizen, and that means protecting citizens' data. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand you back to the chair. Thank you very much, though. Can I thank you all for the way that you've answered the questions? And we need to deliberate on what you've said, but there are a couple of things that I think we need to decide now as a course of action. Um, Caroline Pigeon is uh, attending this meeting, but also we've got Keith Prince from the Transport Committee. It's quite clear we should keep a, some scrutiny focus on this issue in relation to TfL, and the same should be for policing and crime at some stage, if we're going to keep the, the process there that people are on top. So can we give some thinking about that, of how best we do it? We, of course, have, have rightly focused on our responsibilities in the GLA family, but it does say to me uh, there's an all other world out there that, um, from the private sector onwards, about that we should um, use our scrutiny voice to help and support not just the people that want to do the right thing, but anyone thinks they're doing the wrong thing about that. So maybe economy should try and look at how do we influence some of the business interests, the collective groups, London, the Chamber, uh, London First, how do we make sure, and much that there's legislation out there and that message is wider, we just need to keep the focus. Because I think you, I was very much taken by what you said, Elizabeth, you know, 10 years ago, this would have been a a private conversation and very much a tick box, we have to do this or whatever. But it it's actually goes to the heart of uh, actually citizenship and the rights of citizens and okay. how we operate yeah. within our society and what we want. So as public organisations, you know, we will make mistakes. I like to think we would not abuse or seek to undermine those legislations and we want to minimise those mistakes where possible and guard against those issues and that we only get out that right if we get some of the commissioning right and some of the, the thinking about what we're trying to achieve with the data that we own. But it is a fundamentally a relationship with our citizens. You know, if we could, under our power, I would suggest that I think the that London Borough should be having one of these meetings about their own areas, but alas, we haven't got that. Um, but certainly we should encourage and share this information, because I think we should promote our work within London Boroughs to say, if you have got a scrutiny plan and you think there's some issues that you're not quite sure about, this is one worth looking at locally in your area, with the NHS Trust and all the rest of it. So I think we should do that. Um, I feel we're coming on, we're going to have a, a letter to the Mayor at some stage around this. I don't think we need another session, but we do need to think about how do we try and build this into uh, some scrutiny, routine scrutiny, Sean. Just to suggest that we also send what we send, we write to the new Chief Digital Officer for London, Sorry, yep. that, who would, I think, possibly hasn't been recruited on the basis of keeping an eye on this area, but maybe somebody we um, could ask to look at it. Of course. It is uh, a mayor's creature, and I'm all in favour, as people know, of the mayor's uh, policies and decisions. And I think it's wider than that individual. No, and I, I think, think it's. I think it's something that we ought to look at. And I'm looking for the head of paid service around some of those issues about how um, professional officers act uh, appropriately and take their responsibilities seriously, rather than one. But. We will look at that and, I definitely and see say what the right role is. I'm not sure if that, that role is as envisaged as um, what we would envisage it as. I think the Mayor has a different version of that, that for that job. But let's look at that and examine that further 
and see if we can continue to make a difference. Yeah? So we'll look at that. So thank you again. Once again, thank you very much for the way you have answered the questions. Thank you. I think, I think there's Ralph Rule as well. Just oh, yeah. As the question said. Well, that's just very good. We'll, we'll try and draw that together as we look at what you said to us as well. Thank you. We're going to do a quick change over now because we've got another evidence session. Are you basically picking up top now? Yeah. 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 as we uh, come together now for the, the next item, if we could just... <laughs> okay, and just on that last... On that last... On that, just on that last item, just formally, just to do that, the committee is recommended to note the report and the background of the discussion with the invited guests, along with my subsequent commentary and the other suggestions by assembly members to note the subsequent discussion and where action take actions arising from. Let's move on to item six now. Welcome, uh, Steve Ham uh, from uh, on, from the London Resilience. Uh, Steve, do you, do you wish to say anything in the first five minutes or can we go straight into questions? I'm very conscious of time. I wonder if I could just take two minutes, literally, just yes. to, to perhaps um, set a few things out in context because clearly the, the paper is and the, and the agenda item is about the response to Grenfell. Um, if I could just sort of spend a few moments of, of putting where response sits in the bigger picture of resilience. So yes. there's, a, there's a, in fundamental terms, there's a preparation phase, which is the bulk of resilience. Then, of course, there's a response phase that we're going to look at in, in the main this afternoon. And then, then we move into recovery. And they're the sort of general terms that, that are used. So if I could just spend a moment sort of unpicking that first phase, the preparation phase, because much of that is the bulk of what the London Resilience Team do on your behalf. Um, so to unpick that really, there's, there's three bits there. There's the, the complexity of the various components of the GLA, the MET, LFIPA, TFL, in terms of their civil contingencies responsibility. I'll deal with that very, very quickly. Then there's the actual mechanics of what goes on on a daily basis and, and where the actual resource is going into preparedness for London. Uh, and then I'll move in very briefly to response, which hopefully will set a bit of context for you with your, with your questions. Uh, Hopefully. Um, so the complexity piece, we've, we've got um, the Civil Contingencies Act as the driver for all of this. The Met, I'm sure as everybody knows, LFB as a fire and rescue service um, and uh, TFL all have duties under that, that act as, as do other non-GLA and mayor related functions, so health, environment, agency, etc. Um, the distinction that we need to hone in on, really, I think, in the preparedness phase is there's a distinction around the GLA as, as, as distinct to the boroughs as local authorities in terms of Civil Contingencies Act, and there's a distinction with LFIPA, because as we know, it's not just a fire authority, it's a fire and it's a planning authority. So the GLA distinction, really, and is that the GLA, um, after the demise of the Government Office for London, really sort of gained the responsibility for a number of the key functions for London that are unique to London, in the um, guidance to the Civil Contingencies Act and its regulations. Primarily, that's around things like ensuring that there's a risk register for London, that the various risks, threats, hazards, etc., from the National Risk Register are combined with local risks for London so that we've got an idea of the, the capabilities that we need in London for response and recovery. 
Um, some other sort of more mundane aspects of the GLA are things like the Secretariat to the, to the London Resilience Forum, which is the convention of the partnership as, as we know it in London, and of course all of the, the, the sort of back office work that goes with actually producing the emergency plans that will then be deployed when those risks that we spoke about are, are actually realised. So that's the sort of hub of the, the GLA's sort of responsibilities, and that does in, extend into some roles during the response phase. LFIPA, it's worth just touching on LFIPA as a functional body because the, the EP element of LFIPA brings in um, a, a duty, um, and it's Civil Contingencies Act duty, to act as a coordinating function and support function for the London boroughs. And again, that is, that's unique in the Civil Contingencies Act uh, because of the, the obviously the cons complexity of the local authority structure in London. So the other large metropolitan areas don't, don't have sort of borough level resilience forums, etc., like we do in London. So there's a need to coordinate that. That falls to, to LFIPA. Uh, conscious that clearly, you know, whatever happens in London happens in a borough, then that borough coordination function is one that, that obviously will be, I'm sure, subject to some discussion this afternoon, and it's also something that, that, that is worth singling out as it's the LFIPA responsibility. That, that is planned to transfer to, to whatever subsequent arrangements come from uh, LFIPA. Um, so with that said, the day-to-day the -day mechanism of preparedness in London under those sort of duties is um, it's changed in recent years. Uh, Government Office for London Demise, I've mentioned, that sort of led to the creation of the London Resilience Team in the GLA, where it lived for a little while. 2015, that transferred into LFIPA to sit alongside the resource that already existed in the London Fire Brigade that dealt with that statutory duty that LFIPA has. So I think that, that that's history, it makes logical sense. Since, since that 2015 merger, um, the, the integration of those two teams have, have occurred. There's a whole host of detail around there, but I think suffice to say that the function within LFB now is routinely producing the work through what is known as the London Resilience Programme that is sanctioned and authorised by the London Resilience Forum, which is the statutory forum. Um, the type of outputs that come from that programme are the documents, protocols, plans, generally, um, they tend to focus on the, or they will focus by definition on the multi-agency approach to managing emergencies in London. So it's the coordinated joint approach between the various responding agencies. That clearly includes things like blue light services, but blue light emergencies, but there are a whole host of other responders in London which, which obviously would, um, which contribute to this. Um, Final piece on this before we move into the response phase, which hopefully will set the scene for, for some questioning, is the nature of, of how we are preparing in London is to produce plans and protocols that have a generic application. So we're going to focus here clearly on a significant fire. We could also be talking about civil disturbance. We could be talking about terrorism acts and things like that that we've seen in recent times. In any of those cases, it's the generic predetermined plans that come into play. There are a number of those which, which fall into a, a sort of category of supporting plans. So the strategic coordination protocol is probably the prime one, which describes how the various agencies in London can come together, how the LRT can support those. Um, we have recovery coordination protocols, which need to be implemented at the appropriate time. And then we have a range of sort of specific plans. So some of the ones that have been implemented in recent times, humanitarian assistance, we've seen those pan-London plans in implemented for a range of things from the terrorist attacks, obviously um, in Grenfell that was, that was a major consi uh, consideration. Um, shelter and accommodation, that type of thing, is a, a, a strategic plan that can be implemented in London. Uh, as can mass fatalities, uh, mass casualties, evacuation, they're all predetermined plans. So with that sort of background, I thought that might be useful to, to explain that that's where the bulk of the day-to-day -day activity of, of London Resilience's resources go. And then we move, of course, into, into a recovery phase, uh, a response and recovery phase, when an event occurs, such as Grenfell. Well, thank you very much. That's very useful. So we're, we're going to concentrate and focus on the post-initial operation, I know it's all operational there, really about the support to victims then possibly relatives. So the immediate early hours whilst the tragedy occurred, we've got a number of people that need 
some support in some way and how that develops over the days and who does what within that. So that's what we're going to focus on. Depending on this session, we may well be inviting some other people to come and talk to us. Do you know what I mean? We just want to think and get an initial view from uh, your perspective of really. So can we go back to the morning of Wednesday the 14th of June? At what point was the London Resilience Group a duty manager contacted and by whom? Okay, so, um, excuse me, I do, I do need to refer to my notes because I just cannot remember all these times, but um, we, were, we were notified at 0341, that's the precise time. That notification came from um, uh, an internal London Fire Brigade um, notification. Clearly this is a fire situation, uh, a representative of London Fire Brigade, it was actually part of the operational resilience uh, team within LFB. Um, was working at the Brigade Coordination Centre. So as LFB being the, the prime responder in this case, it's, it's their effective role to inform the London Resilience Duty Officer of uh, what's going on. So that was okay. 0341. And so once that call comes through, did the LRG duty manager follow the procedure set out? We've got these, this information yeah. set out in the strategic coordination protocols, or did they use some other reference manual? So we just want to understand what documents we should be looking at. Yeah, okay, so there's there's the strategic coordination protocol, which is, it's a strategic protocol, <laughs> strategic twice, but it's, it's a protocol that has to fit a number of purposes. So it's, it's, a, it, it's, a one, it's not a one-size-fits-all protocol. So this protocol is used from significant civil emergencies like Grenfell. It's also used for things that we can see coming, a rising tide event. It's used quite frequently, uh, particularly in police-led operations for some of the routine events in London. So it's a protocol that is that is applicable to a whole range of activities. The answer though is still yes, so the protocol is followed. Um, it would be somewhat of an oversimplification to think that it's just a, a linear process of progression through that protocol. There are certain components that will be more relevant to certain circumstances than others. Um, there is, however, in, in more detail, which is probably something you haven't had access to, there is a handbook for the London Resilience Duty Officer. Now that spells out in much, much more detail it's literally down to the telephone numbers and the, you know who to contact and in what order. Um, that is the key reference that the London Resilience Officer that was paged at that time on that morning will, will have followed. <coughs> so can you take us through the immediate steps in relation to Grenfell um, that the junior manager took to inform and com communicate with other partner organisations? Yeah, okay, so in terms of the duty tier of officers um, within the London Resilience uh, function, one is that is that pager holder that receives that initial message. We also have, um, and that's the duty manager, we also have a strategic advisor that's on call 24-7 as well to support that, and a duty supervisor. Now that supervisor, you think, who is there to supervise? But the supervisor role is if we have to implement the uh, local authority borough level coordination centre. So the London Local Authority Coordination Centre, there's a supervisor on call that will make all of, of that happen. So those three people are the, are the sort of first people post notification that become aware of the situation at Grenfell. The next thing that has to happen in accordance with, you know, this would be the same for any emergency that's just been triggered, is the, the lead agency. So who is this? In this case, clearly it's the London Fire Brigade there's a need to establish what is this situation then. So start to build the situation awareness. Clearly the fire brigade are aware, but the role of the, the London Resilience Group is to build that general situational awareness that will then have relevance further down the line when we get into an actual formal coordination. clearly it's group. a fast moving situation. So we start off with it's a London Fire Brigade lead operation, which is a major fire. We then get to the situation, it's X number of people we're dealing with and you know that have survived yeah so that and so does and the, and materially then the advice changes or the actions by people changes so in that coordination role that you have yes as i'm sort of getting information so we moved up from actually it's not the fire brigade's job to uh put blankets around people give them something to drink try and get them to a place of safety so how does that, how do, how do we move, move from that, from our initial uh, fire brigade lead agency, actually we're moving to maybe initially a one borough, but a multi-agency approach 
in terms of that support to the survivors? How does that work? Okay, there's, there's a couple because of components. Obviously the yeah. elf, there's an elf yeah. component, isn't it? Because yeah. you have to check them over, yeah. and they're going to go to hospital, or what's, what's that? What, who, what, what happens? Okay, so to, to answer that, there's, there's two pieces. One is a, about the, the high-level strategic coordination to yeah. set the key strategy and objectives for resolving whatever the incident is. In this case, Grenfell, with all of those impacts then beyond the fire that, that you've just articulated. So in parallel, really, these things are happening. So the first one is the convention of a strategic coordinating group. The first one took place at this 0500, so we're about yeah. an hour and 20 minutes after the initial notification. So to make that happen, clearly, the London Resilience Function is, is, is bringing together the necessary people. That took place over the telephone. And as the protocol would, would require, that is initially chaired by the prime agency. So LFP would have chaired that. Yeah. In parallel with that, of course, is clearly a recognition, as you've described, that there's an impact here. Yes, there's a blue light response on the fire, but there is an impact that will inevitably come from this, just as any other type of civil emergency. So clearly that is a borough-related thing. We've previously mentioned around LFIPA's duty and under civil contingencies to provide local authority coordination. The point of contact there is the London Local Authority Gold. So in the same time frame that we're talking about, the London Resilience Officer would have spoken and did speak to the London Local Authority Gold at the time. Now bearing in mind that the Gold... Just, be, just for clarify, that wouldn't necessarily be in the borough, that's no. someone on the pool on the standby list. Yep. Yes. Yep. So okay. it's probably worth just, just yep. clarifying that one. So London Local Authority Gold is, is a resolution effectively between the 33 boroughs that effectively gives a nominated chief exec from one of those authorities at any one time on a rotor basis that, that fulfills this role of Local Authority Gold. That, that's distinct from chief exec in this case of RBKC. It could, by coincidence, have been the same individual at the same time, but it wasn't on this occasion. The concept there is that the local borough involved, RBKC at this, in this instance, has a duty as a Category 1 responder, and it's the chief exec's responsibility to, to initiate the initial responses for the factors that you were highlighting there around displaced people, etc., um, within the affected borough. The concept of the resolution for local authority gold is based upon a recognition that in many cases there will be a need for either mutual aid or the actual event itself is impacting across more than one borough. That requires clearly coordination because you've got more than one borough involved in the response or mutual aid arrangements to an event, it has to be coordinated and that's that duty of LFIPAs. So the conversation with London Local Authority Gold and the affected chief exec in RBKC was going on, as was the arrangements for an 0500 okay. coordinator. So that, the, the meeting at um, 0500, is that in response to the blue light service? They've declared a major incident before yeah. that, yeah. presumably. But is that the blue light coordinating group set up, or is that a different group? How does that work? What's its role? If it's a major incident, is that do they blur into one another? How does it? Okay, yeah. Within the protocol that we have, there are five levels of strategic coordination in London. Yeah. Level four and level five are very, very similar. If we if we looked at it in a linear, progressive yeah. um, way, when we got to level four, that is effectively the blue light emergency services and what's known as a gold coordinating group. Um, that happens on many occasions where the full potential of a, of a scenario has not been realised, maybe, or it's a precautionary thing. In the case of Bremfell, effect, well, no, not effectively, in reality, we went to level five straight away, which is the full strategic coordination yeah. group. It's chaired through the protocol by the, the key agency, in this case, the fire service, yeah. um, but it was more than just the blue light services. And, it, and that continued on and to the key meeting, really, I suppose, po the beginning of the recovery period is the yeah. five o'clock meeting. Is that yeah. really roughly about... Yes. I mean, it would have been before in different ways, but as you move from dealing with the incident and the time it takes to deal with everything there, you're starting then to realise, well, you know what you face because you're dealing with the incident, mm -hmm. but that recovery period of a, another phase... I'm not yes. sure what you emergency people would call it, but it yeah, seems to me that you'd start, you know, yeah. seeing where things are at. 
Yes, um, you're absolutely right. right. It is the recovery phase. So yeah. there's not, it's not a, a, a transition, an absolute transition. Yeah. There's clearly a, a, yeah. a, a sort of building up of recovery. So Grenfell recovery, if we look at it right now, is still in, in, in train. Yes. There's a recovery yeah. coordinating group still running. There's no response activity, as it were, at Grenfell, yeah. really. Um, but that transition, you know, depending on the nature, certainly in Grenfell, is going to always be a long, clearly a long transition because there's a lot of response work to do simultaneous with the, the, the ramping up of recovery. Um, the point I think to make is that within the protocol and the norm of a strategic coordinating group, even in the heat of the moment, so the very first time that the strategic coordinating group meets and sets its strategic yeah. objectives, recovery is an agenda item, it's a standing agenda, yeah. but the agenda item for recovery is, is clearly generally very, very um, a very quick consideration of recovery at that initial stage because in many cases you're still trying to get to grips of what the actual situation is. But transition to recovery management and implementation of recovery management protocol inevitably will be further down the timeline and as you say, late in the afternoon on the Thursday is, it becomes reality. And just in terms of us, so in answer to um, an assembly member, Andrew Boff, has been talking to Jeff Jacobs at a paid service and the timeline's here. R roughly the time taken to um, establish the, the London Resilience Group is about three, three hours. That's not unusual, is it, in a, a critical incident of where people come together, you know, as they're dealing with the response, when we move to that recovery, it's roughly about right. Yeah, I th and, and uh, I think the first, so we need to be careful with terminology, so yeah, the London Resilience Group is a, is a function within the London Fire Brigade, it, it doesn't have a command and control role, the, the yeah. important one here is the strategic the coordinating strategic, group. It might well be yeah. that. that and that to. group, in this instance actually, the first one, albeit was done by telephone because of yeah. the circumstances, 5 o'clock in the morning, that's an hour, that's, well in terms of notification it's an hour and 20 minutes, in terms of the incident you're about 3, 4 hours in. Yeah. That is, that's par for the course, I would suggest. Um, it, there's a number of comparisons we can use just through 2017 with some of the other events that have happened in London. Um, okay, and then just take us through in terms of, so we've got the strategic uh, coordinating group at, at uh, 5 o'clock, it then meets again at 6.30 and then at 8.30. And of course the situation, conversation may well change during that. Can you give us a flavour of what those changes that we might have expected during those those uh, those meetings? Yeah, so you know the tempo there is every sort of hour and a half, two hours, which is which is usual. A lot happens in those two-hour windows or thereabouts, and clearly the bulk of what happens is based on a, a, a growing situational awareness picture that's coming out of, out of the <coughs> scene and a growing understanding of what the impacts are going to be. So what we would expect to happen in those SCGs is that as each one takes place, the strategic objectives are, are continually reviewed, but moreover, they're sort of fleshed out into, okay, what are the actions now that are needed in terms of a strategic coordination. Isn't it? So at five o'clock, the fire brigade are leading those discussions. Are they still leading those discussions? Because I'm getting a picture here. To, does it change who chairs the meeting as the situation changes? Or does the fire brigade continue, but doing it in a multi-partnership way, because the book says this is what needs to happen? So no. I presume at some stage, someone, well, earlier on that would have been decided. At five o'clock, the police say, yeah, we've secured the perimeter of a safe zone, because uh, while firefighters are still doing what you need to do, uh, the council say, yeah, we've initially got something set up, and then we go through some of those issues. That, is that roughly it at five o'clock, and then we actually step up a gear a bit? Yeah. Uh, different actions. How does that? So the chairing of the SCG, the first one will always be the, the agency that has primacy. The lead agency. From, yeah. at, at that meeting, and even yeah. in advance of that meeting, it, in conjunction with the London Resilience Officer, there will be a, well, okay, well, who's going to chair this going forward? So the LFB chaired the first one. Subsequent ones then were chaired by the Met. Um, and then we eventually got into chairing with, with um, recovery management groups as well, with local authority chief execs, etc. So the chair changes, and the chair can change, you know, according to circumstances. It, it's probably worth pointing out that 
in the majority of instances when an SCG is called in London, it's a Met chair because the Met by default will be the lead agency because it's either related to some kind of event management in London or some kind of sort of, if it's a CT related issue or a public order related issue. But I'm right in thinking that the people that chair the meeting, it doesn't matter who chairs it because all the key issues are going to be discussed that are important in terms of relation to that incident. Absolutely. They, there's going to be space and time at that meeting for, um, I don't know, someone saying they want to bring a structural engineer on site to work out X at the appropriate time and someone go and find them done or whatever. Or, you know, um, I'm having some problems. Do people share problems or do people solve problems at these meetings? Do they say, I'm under a bit, I'm stretched here, I haven't got this capacity and I need that. And people chip in, don't chip in, suggestions, there, people with different experiences will have different views on things yeah. because by their nature of their what they bring to the table. The strategic coordination group is primary, primarily focused on, as you would expect, the key strategy for resolving the incidents and identifying the key areas that need to be action and the prioritisation within that. Yeah. There's a tactical level of coordination, right. which is where the much more detailed level of you know, um, sort of resource allocation and things like that takes place. And then there's an operational level, which would actually be on scene. Okay, so on the tactical level, if I'm supporting uh, survivors and victims, so we've got one level the NHS is supporting them because they need some healthcare issues, and I've got a number of people that are displaced by the incident. And so that would be dealt with within the local government family. And below this strategic subgroup, can I envisage then a little working group working their way through the issues of what they may find in outcomes? Yes. I.e. I've got no money, I've got no, you know, as they, it won't be an issue at five o'clock in the morning, that will come later. But, you know, that's where that, that there will be a subgroup, is what you're saying. If, if, we, if we go back to the, the fact yeah. that, the, that there are standing plans, yeah. so humanitarian assistance is, is a plan. It has a scope and it has a predetermined yeah. um, methodology and structure that could be stood up at the, at the tactical level in an affected area. The lead for that, in the case of Grenfell, would have been Kensington and Chelsea. So that tactical level of... I, of providing a, a focal point for humanitarian assistance at the starting point fits within the scope of that plan. The plan was, was initiated and led by RBKC at the locality. The strategic coordinating group is located distance. It's not at the scene. It's located in a, in a metropolitan police facility in Lambeth. So the strategic focus in the SCG, the Strategic Coordinating Group, is all about let's yeah, keep the high level yeah. picture. Okay, I get the high level picture, but my, if I'm in KNC, my, my point person, if I call them that, sitting in Lambeth, will be the London Council's gold person, I presume. It Either at the end of a telephone, yeah. or physically in that meeting. Yes. So I, I might not have a KNC person there, because I'm dealing with it on the ground. I ain't going to send someone away over there to do it. Maybe, but, you know, it's unlikely, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to say it, it depends, and I'll have to explain why it depends. So, yeah. the, in the strategic coordinating group, absolutely there needs to be representation from the local authority affected. Yeah. There are two scenarios that can pan out here. The first one is that the local authority concerned determines that it, will, it, will, it won't invoke the local authority gold arrangements, which involves the mutual aid and the gold resolution and that it will represent itself effectively at that strategic coordinating group. So that's what happened in the case of, certainly in the early, in the early stages of Grenfell. Hold on, oh, sorry, so, look, please, who's invoking what? Does it need KMC to invoke the local government gold group or do you, no, it needs by KMC. your virtu virtual saying actually we've got a bit of a problem here, and contacting London Council's gold representative to say as the first Point because that's part of your reference group. Who invokes who? The chief executive of the affected borough has to invoke the London Local Authority Gold. That's arrangement. interesting. Right, okay. So, so that is. But you're clearly... still ringing those persons. Yes. So, so I, I, you know, I might, you know, thanks for the tip off, I'll wait for a phone call. Is that how so it works? In, a, in effect, the London Resilient, my staff, will 
to get everything in place Ready. should yeah. the local okay. authority chief exec concern okay. Okay. activate the London local authority goal arrangement. Just before I pass on to colleagues then, so when did local government first take the chair of the strategic coordinating group? On the uh, or the SCG, they took recovery coordination on the Friday. I'm going to have to look behind me. Tell you, I'm not sure. I don't think we ever did it. The was it police all the way through? Yeah. So so police chaired strategic right coordination through, through, right the way through because clearly it's become a criminal investigation and all of that type of thing. Yeah. Local authority gold did step in. London local authority gold, not RBKC and chair the recovery coordination group, which stood up on the Friday. Now obviously, you're going to do your learning <laughs> lessons bit, we'll come back to, to yeah. later. K and C are doing their learning lessons bit. Yeah. When did K and C first uh, meet to discuss the response? Do we know? Have you managed to find that out? Uh, in terms of it, within lessons? K and C on, on the morning of the, yeah. the fire, I, I don't know, t I couldn't give you that detail right now, no, I don't okay. know. All right, okay, we'll need to come back to that, I think. Okay, over to you, Sean. Um, yes. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about the sort of humanitarian stuff on the ground. Yeah. Um, we can see from the answers, uh, the, the rundown of each meeting, that the first meeting that the British Red Cross were in was the 0830 meeting. Um, and can you explain to us who and by whom was actually tasked with supporting the survivors and setting up the rest centre, which became a focal point? So. So the rest centre stuff will be, is part of that humanitarian assistance plan yeah. will include um, predetermined approaches that have been agreed by local authorities. I should, I should mention that for each of the pan-London plans, or capabilities as we call them, there's a lead partner within the statutory partnership. The lead partner for humanitarian assistance is local authorities. Mm -hmm. So local authorities themselves own the plan in the same way, for example, that Metropolitan Police own the Strategic Coordinate Protocol. So there's a lead agency that is, that is by level of appropriateness really looks after the various capabilities. So local authorities, because the task of providing humanitarian assistance is going to fall to local authorities, it's local authorities that, that are the lead agency for producing that plan. Is, is that the same thing as the local authority goal? No. Right, <coughs> so it's the actual local authority on the ground. Yes, so the local authority concerned will, will, will be able to implement the humanitarian assistance plan. You assume, and you're planning, <coughs> that the local authority yes. will be capable of doing that. Yes, right. and then if we look at other events in London recently, if we think of something, for example, like the Croydon tram crash, Croydon will have, will have implemented some form of humanitarian assistance. Yeah. The issue is one of scale, clearly. So um, there's a there's a there's a, a limit to the to the ability of any one borough to provide humanitarian assistance, and there are there are metrics on that, but there is a limit to that. So I'm, I'm familiar that local authorities have a plan for like rest centres. They're in, yeah. they're, they're yeah. named. The Red Cross is is called in when it reaches a certain scale. Is that right? When the there's, there's the two levels here, so at the strategic coordination group level and the tactical coordination. At the strategic level, deal with that one first, when a strategic coordination group is called, the invitation goes to a predetermined list. It's the entire representative of the partnership. So the voluntary sector, including the Red Cross and others, will be part of that. So there's an opportunity there. Whether they can take it at five o'clock in the morning is another matter, but certainly once you get into a normal tempo, representation at the strategic level will include all of the relevant members of the And they're told straight away? Yes, so that, that mechanism to alert people is there. Of course, not every organisation is a 24-7 response organisation. At the tactical level, so on the ground at RBKC, within that, the delivery of the, the plan for humanitarian assistance, which, was, which would then be in, instigated and resourced by that local authority, and the key decisions are made by the person in charge of that humanitarian assistance centre, the same principle applies. There's, a, there's an ability to bring in the Red Cross, the voluntary sector, and all of the other contacts that the partnership has. Okay, but they still, even though they're on the SCG, they still have to be brought in into the humanitarian side of it by the local authority. That's As part of the, the, the implementation of the plan, yes. Right, okay. I have one more question, which is about the same thing, but about communication. 
um, because I think it was very difficult to know who to contact about, as, and this is as a, as a representative, because um, I'm a London wide assembly member. A few days later, this is, in, on about the 19th, I think it was, and I sent the message in on the 20th. People called me and said, you know, this is wrong, the local community need more traffic controls, you know, um, there's not enough things of a certain kind at the rest centre, I spoke to volunteers at the rest centre. People wanted me to pass on this information and I'm the representative and I thought, well, I will. I had no idea who to pass it on to and that was a real issue. And in the end, I sent it to the Red Cross, who I'd met, who were the only people I could speak to on the ground. I, meant, I got it through to the Red Cross goal commander and I sent it to the Mayor's office here, who I think sent it to the local authority gold. Now, I'm not even sure from talking to you whether that was right. Obviously, the message got through eventually. Things, things were done in response to my queries. It's just an example, but sh is there... There doesn't seem to be a way for people on the ground to raise issues in, in that sense of communication. I know that regular sort of announcements are made from the central group, yeah. but how does anyone raise information they might have about if they have 10 survivors in their church? How do they let people know? That side of communication doesn't seem to be... It wasn't there. Is there a? Should it have been? Was there a plan for that? Yes, there should. There, 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 what there is a communications plan clearly for major emergencies in mm. London. But does it go up as well as down? It, yes, it does. Okay, good. Um, the the example you give is is a is if there is a sort of significant, as opposed to sort of operational detail thing. For example, from your position as an assembly member going through, the, 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 effectively, the mayor's office has a seat at the SCG. Yeah, so that makes sense So to that's me. the routing there for the sort of things that, that are of a higher level type thing. If it's an operational thing, you know, how many, there's some people in the church down the road, are you aware of that on the ground? That, is, that really is something that needs to be coordinated at the local level by the, in this case, RBKC, that are running their mm. humanitarian assistance centre. And, and coordinating information out to the public. We mustn't forget that local authorities are Category 1 responders under the Act, and therefore their duty, just as much as the GLA has a duty, is, which is a coordinating one, the actual nuts and bolts, I suppose, of an operational capability on the ground rest with the whole plethora of designated yeah. responders. And so how is it... It's impossible, really, for someone like me, therefore, or somebody who's running a church or something, to know who to contact is that that's should there not be some sort of standard well, then, procedure yes there should be through the local arrangements on the ground of some kind yeah. yes so you, there should be something on the ground through the local arrangements of humanitarian assistance where there is a, an information gateway mm. of course it will take time to put that in place yeah okay let's move on to questions seven and eight um steve good afternoon um at what point was the London Local Authority goal informed? I think I'm getting a feeling it was at or around five in the morning. And who was the London Local Authority goal at that time? Um, it was shortly before five, I think. Uh, just bear with me a second. Toby, have you got that there? Sorry, I can't find it. Sorry, 4.38, got email on there. 4.38, there we go. So 4.38 was the initial conversation between the London Resilience Duty Officer and the Duty Local Authority Gold. Mm -hmm. uh, that Local Authority Gold, uh, we've mentioned this before, it wasn't um, from Kensington and Chelsea. Um, local Authority Gold was the Chief Exec from... Okay. Now, quite by chance, the fortnightly um, possession of London Local Authority goal was changing at nine o'clock that morning, wasn't it? Yes. So, yeah. the chief executive of Havering had the first call, yeah. and then they did their shift change or whatever you call it at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, would that normally happen? I, I appreciate that's the scheduled change. Are there any disadvantages to that happening in the middle of an incident like this? Um, there would have been had the London Local Authority gold arrangements being stood up but at that stage if we recall some of the previous questions the the approach to this within Kensington and Chelsea is that we will manage 
this within Kensington and Chelsea. We do not want to invoke the London Local Authority gold arrangements. So that, so that was no the difference. position at nine o'clock. Okay. So at that point, the London Local Authority gold was not uh, having any impact, um, was not playing any role, was probably better, uh, in what was going on. The formal protocol hadn't been triggered. Yeah. The, London, the, the London Local Authority Gold was fully aware of what's going on because my people were talking to that gold and the one that was scheduled to come on purely by coincidence. It was shift change day at 9 o'clock. Yeah. So both of those individuals were aware. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in response to your question, yes, it would absolutely have been an issue, and I doubt if that transition would have happened yeah. had the London Local Authority Gold arrangements been triggered. Yeah. But the fact that they hadn't, Mm. And both individuals were aware of the situation and aware of everything being ready should the trigger uh, be uh, when actioned. Were, when were they triggered? Uh, it was later on the Thursday. So in the 24 to 36 hours after yeah. the first emergency call, that's when RBKC yeah, triggered. It was the afternoon of the Thursday. So, yeah. Okay. Um, when the SCG meetings were taking place, who was communicating with um, KNC? Uh, the first few SCGs, so the five, six, eight o'clock ones on the Thursday morning, on the morning of the fire, um, the local authority gold from Havering, as we've discussed, was represented effectively by uh, one of my officers because the thing hadn't been implemented, and then uh, officers from RBKC were present at the SCGs. Uh, certainly, the first one I remember was on the telephone, mm. um, so they were representing RBKC from within their own. <coughs> Stuff. Uh, was it suggested to them at any point on the morning of the Wednesday that they might want to consider triggering uh, London Local Authority Gold? Certainly, um, my officers have sp had spoken on numerous occasions, I think, to RBKC and the two Local Authority Golds either side of the shift change to make the point that everything was uh, in place. We had actually pre-stood up the local authority coordination centre so that it could hit the ground running, it was ready, it was staffed. Um, the decision, however, remains clearly with the chief exec um, of the affected borough at the time. Okay. Who was taking over London Local Authority Gold at 9 o'clock that morning? That was chief exec from Barkin and Dagenham. Barkin and Dagenham. Okay. I'm struggling somewhat, and I think a lot of people are struggling. Uh, was, was any rationale given by Kensington and Chelsea for not triggering that for such a long time? Yes, the rationale was primarily that, well it was, that the impact of this event was contained within the borough, within RBKC. Um, probably worth pointing out that if we look at perhaps other incidents, that's not unusual. Mm -hmm. um, not always is the full local authority gold structure initiated. So for Westminster Bridge and for London Bridge and Borough Market, we didn't, or the local authority concerns at Westminster and Southwark, didn't feel that they needed the London Local Authority Gold because the incident was, was manageable from within their own borough. So that sort of topographical rationale is, is not uncommon. Mm. Um, there are perhaps other elements to a decision, but clearly my role is not in the decision making, but the rationale that was given was that the, um, the fire and the, the immediate area affected by the fire was contained within a single borough. Yeah. Um, I mean, on, on the face of it, there, there, are, there is some plausibility in that argument. It, it clearly was in one borough, and it was a very fast-moving incident, so hindsight's always wonderful. But um, had uh, local authority gold been triggered uh, sooner, what material difference would that have made to the response on the ground? I don't mean the fire uh, fighting, I mean everything else. Uh, the, the gold resolution, so the local authority gold resolution, provides, through well, LFIBA, with that statutory duty that we discussed earlier, a coordination centre for local authorities. Its, it's, it's fundamental purpose is where an event in London impacts over more than one borough and therefore the response needs to be coordinated from the boroughs. Wide area flooding, for example, so the flooding in South London, in Croydon and Sutton, etc. in recent years, that, that's a good example of that probably. Um, however, in terms of material difference, it's 
there is also clearly in that coordinating structure the ability to coordinate mutual aid. So mutual aid for capability within boroughs is coordinated through that local authority coordination centre, apologies for all these long-winded words, that, that is overseen by the local authority gold if those arrangements are triggered. Now in that eventuality, what role would the, for want of a better phrase, host borough play? That can be determined between the two, the local authority gold concerned and the chief exec of the local authority. So uh, in many cases you might find that clearly the, 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 the focus of the chief exec of the affected borough will be on the event in their borough, clearly. Um, the local authority gold, the, the whole sort of rationale behind the resolution between all the boroughs, is that that then provides an additional layer of chief exec capacity with predetermined sort of delegated authority to spend on behalf of other boroughs, etc. And that has traditionally worked very well in London, and it goes way back to even seven, seven times where the chief exec of Camden and Westminster wasn't necessarily involved in the local authority gold, which, which coordinated the broader co um, sort of multi-borough effort to, to provide mutual aid to, to, to the aftermath of those events. So the answer to your question, I think, is that, that, that in a, an idealised model, it, it's always variable and it is, it's, 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 it, it, it's, there's discretion in there, but normally you would see the chief exec of the affected borough dealing with the event in the borough and the local authority gold is, is doing exactly what the resolution does which is overseeing the efforts of coordination including mutual aid. In this instance uh, when Kensington and Chelsea triggered the local authority gold uh, what was their role after that point? So KNC still had, uh, we touched earlier on humanitarian assistance, the, 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 the pla pre-planned um, humanitarian assistance stuff that was implemented in Kensington and Chelsea, they would have carried on obviously with, with that. They have a number of other duties clearly as a local authority that, that fall outside of the, the sort of civil contingencies uh, arena. Uh, but certainly in terms of the emergency response phase, KNC still had an active role in humanitarian assistance uh, evacuation and shelter, which is another of the key plans. So they were involved in the in the management of that, as you would expect, because that's that's within the affected borough. Okay, thank you, James. Okay, just um, can you just remind me who is KNC's goal? Who was KNC's goal goal in the early hours? Uh, it was the chief exec. It was the chief exec. Okay, um, okay. Let's then move on. Um, Peter. Yeah. <coughs> Good afternoon, Steve. Um, could you summarise for us what worked well in terms of using and working through the strategic coordination protocol that morning and what basically could have worked better? Okay, so on the, the working well, um, the protocol that's in force now I think was signed off either at the end of 16 or the beginning of 17 at the LRF, so it's a, it's a revised protocol. It's the, all of the Pan-London plans are revised as you'd expect on a periodic basis. A couple of the changes that were implemented worked well, which I was pleased with. Um, this isn't the first time it was tested, it's clearly been tested through Croydon and the other events since then that have happened in London. Um, but in particular, this sort of five level approach that we've referred to, and in this case with Grenfell we went straight to level five, um, that sort of, the, the understanding and acceptance of that within the partnership I think we we're very pleased with. So what I'm effectively saying now is a revised protocol, the revisions worked. Um, in terms of the, the front end of it, the initiation, that worked well. So the lead agency, London Fire Brigade, did what you would expect the lead agency to do. Once they knew they had declared a major incident, then clearly they, they made the necessary call into the London Resilience Team, the duty officer. Um, I'm very content that that duty officer and the other two that I mentioned swung into action, did the necessary notifications, all of the procedural stuff that you would expect in those, in those early stages. Um, in terms of you know, what could be better with strategic coordination, um, I would couch my answer in so much as this is probably a generic answer and it's not one that's just necessarily specific to Grenfell. With strategic coordination, the biggest challenge is convening that first strategic coordinating group. Mm. It's even worse at five o'clock in the morning because mm. you clearly you've got the 24-7 element of some agencies and you've got the unavailable element of others. Um, can I ask, sorry, you, you say that's very difficult. Just 
practically speaking, I'm trying to get a picture, if you five o'clock in the morning or three o'clock, whatever it is, yeah. uh, is this done, what is, how is it done, just simply on the phone? The mechanics of it is, is effectively, there's a, there's a, a distribution list, there's mm. pages, there's all of the mm. normal sort of mechanisms that you would expect. But all of the members of the partnership that have an operational role, and, <coughs> and we mentioned things like the voluntary sector earlier, they will be notified of the convention of the strategic coordinating group. As we said, the ability to, to get there and service it is, is difficult. Um, to, to complete that answer to your question, though, that the, the what could be better is a generic what could always be better. It's always a challenge to get an effective first group together and determine, you know, number one priority what are our strategic objectives here in a, in a command and control sense. Myself and my team play an advisory role in that because we are the people that clearly know the, the, the detail of the various <coughs> plans and things for London. But it's a very difficult thing. In this case, the first one, it was the London Fire Brigade officer that was chairing. Subsequently, it was Met Police commanders. It's, in the early SCGs, it's always very difficult to determine your strategic objectives um, because of the lack of a general situational awareness. So the biggest challenge always is what exactly is happening here from a strategic thing and what is the what are the impacts that we're going to see 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, 3 weeks, 3 months down the line. Getting that picture is, is the challenge. Um, so I sort of I wouldn't say that didn't work well. I would suggest that is the challenge. The procedural side of the protocol I've got no problem with. I think we always suffer in the early stages from uh, a lack of um, the picture that we would like to inform those strategic objectives. Although you went to a level five quite quickly, didn't you? Yeah, purely because it was it was evident, I think, from all the initial feeds. We're mm. talking mm. multiple people involved here. We've only got, I mean, let's not forget the media as a source of immediate information. I think all of us that were sort of um, you know, awake in the middle of the night there you, it, it becomes, you know, in many cases, things just become blindingly obvious that this is a, a high impact event and it will require the full level five sort of That's strategic order. And, and there goes to the heart of the problem of looking outside in, isn't it? So we've got all the protocols and procedures, and we've got one partner probably saying it's all going all right and I don't need some help. I think we can cope with this. What do the other partners do? And when do the partners say, actually make you do and no we're not going to wait for those protocols because things are not working to or in the interest of dealing with this emergency yeah. so what, what the, how does that work then i, I the, think that, the that emergency world then? yeah that that works just just i think as you alluded to earlier you know by the time we got to the afternoon of the following day yeah. it, it, it we got to a stage i think in the scg got to a stage where Within those strategic objectives, which are all about Im impact management, and you know they they in include welfare and um, assistance to affected people, those objectives start to get fleshed out further and further through each SCG, and I think it eventually becomes apparent that in any one of those, if we need more resource, then more resources required. So it's a it's a it's a collective approach, I think, through the, the, that naturally evolves those actions required until it becomes sort of obvious where the, where the pressure points are. And just before, just to help us in terms of understand, so in that subgroup you described, in the sort of, because obviously partner organisations and you work with those, so we would be right in thinking where the council isn't the landlord, the, the housing association or the whatever it is that's TMO running it would be part of any emergency planning framework within a, a local emergency plan. They'd be there. Should they be there? Will they be there? How does it work? What do your papers say in preparation to major disasters? That, that level of, of the planning is, 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 is not... I would find it difficult to answer that question because that's that's site specific planning. Um, I, I, yeah, we, be, live in a, we live in a world of next steps agencies, isn't it? Lots yeah. of London boroughs now do not have direct relationship with um, with tenancy housing and tenancy issues. Yeah. They have arms length agencies. So if it's relating to 
a tugger, would that not be, is it not reasonable to me to assume that somewhere in the emergency plan is a category one responder, getting my plan together, I think that's in legislation, yeah. that we should have some response that somewhere, uh, if people wanted to ask the question, there would be no, you know, people involved in dealing with an emergency. <coughs> if it's appropriate, they, they, they'll be there. I think if, if it's appropriate, and it, uh, you know, I can't, I really can't speak for the content of individual emergency plans, no, but, but, but but certainly you, the there would need to be clearly people who have control of key elements of, of a plan would need to be involved in the plan. I suppose I, you know, that's a, a good. Right. Okay. Should we move on to sorry, Caroline? Can I just ask one thing I'm not understanding is Kensington and Chelsea chief executive saying I don't need any help. Um, and it was, was it Thursday afternoon? Yeah. It shifted. Yeah. When I went out to visit one of the centres, I was talking to a member of staff from Ealing, yeah. who had basically, of his own back, it yeah. seemed to me, rocked up because he'd done lots of work in, in other emergencies around London, mm -hmm. saw there was an issue, rocked up and said it was so chaotic, he just took over and they were, Ealing were running this centre. So if you're saying that Kenzie was still in charge of humanitarian and all this stuff on the ground, yet actually it seemed to me that the goodwill of officers in other boroughs just saw this and just went in and did that. Yeah. Is that really what went on? So though KNC is saying we're in charge, actually it, other boroughs were already he, coming he in. The tasks were being done by volunteers as well. Yeah, yeah so, that, so there are two things there. Yes, you're absolutely right. So I think there was, what, what you've got there is mutual aid happening. Um, without, without, without the, the chief executive KNC authorising it effectively. Uh, yes, and without the coordinating function, which is the one that LFIPA provides and that my staff have uh, the ability to, to staff up and withstood to, uh, without that, you know, being really drawn in to, to, to assist with those things. So it was a little bit ad hoc in those early stages, clearly, as you described. Just before we move on to the role of the mayor, when do you think you're going to have your learning lessons paper then? How quickly do you get it back into your, in case we have another yeah. Groveville or yeah. similar okay. catastrophe? So what happens with, uh, so what the partnership does, so each individual agency clearly will do their, their, their own um, sort of debrief on this. What the, what the LRF does and what my team facilitate is um, we produce a report that then is taken to the London Resilience Partnership, uh, to the LRF for, for sign-off. So they meet three times a year. So there's one in Octo uh, October, the next one will be in February. So I, it's unlikely that we'll get it to October, so I would suggest that will go for formal sort of sign-off at the LRF first into, into 2018. Uh, to give you an idea of where we are with it, next Friday, is it Friday, certainly the 22nd of this month, whenever that is, in a few days' time, that's the first meeting between the various agencies to debrief the strategic coordinating protocol. So not the, not the bits and pieces around individual agencies, but everything we've been talking about this afternoon, the debrief on that and the initial meeting starts next week. Okay, let's move on. On to the yeah. Great. This is about the role of the mayor. Yes. Um, we've been told previously that the mayor's advisory group is a reactive body that looks at incidents as they occur. Yeah. Uh, do you know if they met on that day? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Um, and I would normally be asked to attend, so my knowledge, to my knowledge, the mayor's advisory group didn't meet. Didn't meet, okay. And uh, do you know if any government ministerial meetings uh, took place on that Wednesday morning? Uh, yes, they did. Um, and was the mayor there? The mayor definitely had attended those. I couldn't tell you whether it was on the Wednesday or the Thursday without checking back. But the arrangements that are in place for the mayor to uh, attend COBRA um, Sorry, I'm just thinking back. Certainly the mayor definitely attended COBRA ministerial meetings when we had the sort of post-Manchester move to critical stuff. I'm not sure if the mayor did attend ministerial meetings, sorry, on Grenfell. So right can, I, can I help the mayor? And to, we, we can check, but the mayor did attend COBRA. I don't think it attended on Wednesday, as yeah. Steve's just saying. And normally the mayor attends by invitation. Yeah. Perhaps you, you could let the chair know. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
sorry, um, is, so we've got that, is the, uh, right, Keith Prince is not here, I'm going to do his questions. So we know that the, uh, the terminologies of gold, but for, we understand um, that the mayor's got a gold cell, which is not like the traditional gold, silver, bronze approach, uh, convened that morning. Uh, if so, what did it do? To, right, so what do you know of that? And are you involved in any of those arrangements around that? Um, yeah, I'm involved as a, as a point of contact with that. So if, if we look at the GLA and the Mayor's Office as having duties under Civil Contingencies Act, just like all the other partners, then clearly they need, there needs to be arrangements in place for the Mayor's Office and the GLA to speak either within a strategic coordinating group or within the partnership generally. So that gold cell that you refer to is, I mean, effectively it's, 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 it's a couple of people that on a routine basis are the point of contact. I know who those are right now and they know who I am and who our duty people are. So uh, it works. Um, in practice, it's probably just worth talking it through how it works. I mentioned social media earlier. These days when an emergency occurs in London, everybody knows about it straight away, normally. Um, so very quickly these days what tends to happen is phone calls take place, if we talk about the Mayor's Office and the, and the GLA, between that, that GLA gold, as it's labelled now, and myself, quite often those, uh, those phone calls will take place before the declaration of a major incident. Because let's paint a picture, media. so let's paint a picture then. So on this particular occasion, we didn't need the Mayor's Advisory Group, but we did have the gold cell group. We had the gold, which is, who's gold in the GLA in terms of proper gold, not made up gold. There's a GLA duty gold officer who is, I right. think, whom Steve is referring yes, to. That's the GLA duty gold. Right, so there is a duty, and they have individual discussions. And of course, the mayor may well be having discussions with the, the lead responder, the FB, the mayor's chief of staff, and there'll be a level of activity, all three. For the, the for that bit for this part of the meeting, do we know between you if ever wh where the mayor had any discussions of the need not for us directly but involved in the need to provide support or survivors for um, to victims and families? Do, has the mayor raised any of those issues? Were there any conversations at that early stage? Well, it could, be over the, it could be over the, the first three days, the way it's working here, between you know local government, the way, the way it's occurred as we drifted uh, to some view of mutual aid was required. Um, I, um, I, I can be, I stand to be corrected on this, um, um, so we can check easily. Um, I don't think we were, as a GLA, formally asked um, in any way do that because this is a local authority gold arrangement, it's mutual aid as between local authorities. However, um, we did make um, some uh, offers of help on an informal basis. So for example, we provided some members of the housing team to go in um, early to provide some support um, and we also offered to provide and still exists um, as I think you know but directly, some people to help on the community um, and support side. Um, and I think we have a couple of people still there um, doing that. And beyond that, we obviously were making contact to see whether or not any help was I don't think we need to know now, needed. but it'd be nice to know where those discussions took place so we understand how that system works. And I think, um, can you just, and also, can you provide us, was that the offer made direct to KNC or through the local government goal? London Council's gold. Can't what was the conversations yeah. were we having? Were we direct with KNC? Because it seems to me that's pretty crucial at the early stages before it moves to the local government goal. Sean. Just quickly to Jeff. <clears throat> Team London are our volunteer squad, effectively. Were they ever mobilised? Yes. At what point? What? When? When? Um, I can't precisely can remember. We, can we find but out? But we did offer Team London support. I think quickly. I did at one point speak to one of the team and, and yeah, mention, I think it I was a way all, after the initial um, issues. We can find out when and, yes. and find out yeah. if they can potentially be better, more quickly mobilised in some situations like this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And can, we find, can we also find out if um, the mayor or mayor representatives, that would be GLA officers but not but also the mayor's office, 
uh, ever talk directly to London Local Authority Gold, but also KMC's Gold. So we just have that uh, picture in our mind if ever those conversations took place. Okay, any more on that section? So now I'm going to move into the final section, which is about Lord Harris. Um, so can you just tell me, who is leading for this work for, local, for London Council's Local Authority Gold? Who is the lead officer in my... Is there one lead officer? Is there a cooperative? Sorry, are, you, are we talking about Lord Harris, or is this... No, sorry, I was there, but I've just, yeah, it, sorry. just yeah, okay. triggered, um, looking at you, triggered <laughs> me. Who is the person... John Baradell, City of London. John Baradell, yeah. City of London, is the key person to go to who we ought to talk to at some yeah, he's, he, uh, he is, certainly from my perspective for London Resilience, he is the, the gateway to the boroughs. He's clearly Excellent. the custodian of That's the, the resolution helpful. for local authority call. Very helpful. OK. Um, OK, <laughs> let's move on to Lord Harris, then. So... Um, do you mind if I just add, of like that, because the sort of up-to-date position is, I don't, it doesn't affect what Steve has said, I don't think, um, in terms of talking to John, but I think the up-to-date position is that um, the recovery work is effectively fully handed over to um, uh, Kenson and Chelsea, and Barry Quirk, who was on an interim basis, um, uh, doing the chief executive job uh, has now stood down from Lewisham and has taken on the permanent role at Kensington and Chelsea and therefore is the first and key point of contact at Kensington and Chelsea. In Kensington, yeah. That transition happened Friday, so last Friday. Okay, um, so Lord Harris's preparations, he did his report, he also commented about the move from GLA to the uh, LFB. Part of the reasons we understand, we know at the time, because I think the report came to this committee, uh, was about the benefits of citing the team next to the LFB and local authority teams. How did the three teams work together to deal with the aftermath of Grenfell Fire? Uh, what decisions did the teams have to make then in terms of that post reorganisation? Okay, uh, effectively, it's, it, for oh, practical purposes, it's one team now. So I think oh, that's right. the key message there. Yeah. So, you might have noticed the subtle difference in the London Resilience team was the GLA component that we've been yes. discussing today. That there used to be a team within the LFB that looked after the borough coordination. There's just an efficiencies of, of scale exercise there where combining them in one group. They effectively now, the way I've structured it, it's taken a couple of years, but we have generic job descriptions. We have ability for each member of that team to do whichever functional role is required. Okay, so in the Lord Harris 2016 review into preparedness of emergency services, he found a general sense of confidence amongst local authorities that local authority gold arrangements would ensure that coordination assistance across the capital would be effective. Now, this is a very difficult question I'm going to put to you, but it's one that's going to be asked at some stage, so you might as well ask it now. Given the widespread sense that maybe that there, there could have been a slightly different response from the local authority response, um, others would say it's slow, but there is, it's more complex than that. Do, we, do you still have the confidence in the local authority gold arrangements? And can I just add to that, because this is one of our formal opinions, more about the triggering of mutual aid and when. Is that not something that we could start to ask questions about now? Not about, this is not about blame. It's not about, you know, beating <coughs> someone up over the head. It's about trying to learn the lessons fast. Um, yes would be the short answer, but I will need to qualify it. So yes, as much as I think there is absolute faith in the local authority gold arrangements, I certainly wouldn't want to see those undone. Is there room for uh, an expansion of, of of the nature of those arrangements, my professional view would be probably yes. Um, if you don't mind, if I can just bring in a couple of other factors that might qualify that, there are there are a number of uh, considerations, I suppose, about local authority capacity to respond, which 
isn't born just out of Grenfell. I think there's clearly uh, a focus on that within the Cabinet Office and the Civil Contingency Secretariat there that, that clearly sort of have ultimately the, the eye over the Civil Contingencies Act and how it manifests itself in localities. Um, certainly, David Bellamy and, Bellamy and myself were asked to visit CCS last week, it was, to talk through in outline terms our views on perhaps what might be better uh, sort of arrangements in the future for local authority, um, not just coordination, but moreover capacity to respond. Um, and obviously there are a number of views that I have and I think others have on that. But suffice to say, it is a live agenda around local authority, capacity, arrangements for mutual aid, not just in London, but across the nation, you know, right up to a national level. Um, so within that sort of context, um, I know that certainly um, John Baradell is looking, he's, the word is reviewing the arrangements with local authorities in London. Um, I haven't yet met him since Grenfell, but that is due somewhere um, in the next few weeks. So there is, I think, already a momentum perhaps around, um, you know, not in a critical way, but in a realisational way that you know, this is not just about where an incident takes place and which boroughs it, it's in. It's about where the capacity comes from to handle it. And if it gets really significant, in, as we saw with Grenfell, then sometimes that capacity may need to come from not just within London but from elsewhere. There are similar approaches to that level of pre-planning for capacity, certainly in blue light services, police, fire, NHS, mutual aid arrangements on a national basis. So I think there's an agenda there. Um, I have some ideas and views on how that might manifest itself in London. Clearly that, that extends up to departmental level for how it might work well, you know, across the we'd, country. We'd like to see those in writing to us about those views. Even if you want to say these are initial views and they've got to be shared, and they are, of your, you know, yeah. your team, I think we'd welcome that. Um, and could you also add to that about you know, self, I'm a great believer in self-improvement and, you know, peer review, but clearly sometimes uh, self-assessment, peer review might not well be good enough in terms of some of the some of these issues and, you know, um, I would like your thoughts on that. In terms of how do you know that your organisation is fit for purpose or really up to tackling some of the tasks that you're going to face? I, I think that, that, that question is, is one that, um, again, I have some, some views on, um, the, and it, I'm not alone in these views. The, 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 the Civil Contingencies Act is, a, is, a, is an absolutely fine piece of legislation. It creates a local resilience partnership, it convenes through a forum, and it puts duties on those that need to be there. But that's where it stops. So there's no real there's no assurance over what actually happens. Um, I'm certainly keen, because this is London as much as anything else, that we have some kind of assurance regime over that. Um, I'd say I'm not alone in that. The, one of the things that I'm involved with, that, along with some colleagues, is the cabinet of CCS are, are developing a British standard. So the BSI um, works, so I'm on one of those committees, we're making progress on a standard for city resilience. So that's, that's, that was never there before, but clearly you know, a British standard is, is, is the first building block of some kind of assurance regime. Mm. Um, developments of relationships with other similar risk profile cities in the UK, particularly Manchester, got a very good working relationship with them. Um, you know, lots of parallels with London um, in terms of you know, mm. uh, borough level sort of need for coordination, etc. So beyond peer review, yes, I think yes, the development of standards that were involved in for city resilience, there's probably a more beyond peer review. I think there's something that perhaps we could do with other, uh, other uh, metropolitan authority areas, particularly, I mentioned Greater Manchester and others. Um, and there are national and international frameworks as well to, to perhaps look towards in terms of, you know, a measure of where London is compliant. So the United Nations have a very good sort of resilience framework that that asks a number of questions. We've never really in London been through the, the, the process of, of assessing ourselves against those and using the resources that come from things like the United Nations and, and Rockefeller and others that are involved in the, the city resilience world these days. So I think it's fair to say, in the way that you've answered questions this afternoon, 
that there will be changes to the way that we work or further guidance may be further testing about that recovery phase and then about the crucial issue of intervention mutual aid who triggers yeah. which is that, is that fair to say we're going to be looking at that and we don't we're not going to be waiting for inquiries to do that if we need to make those changes to because we can do a better job then we're going to be doing that is that where your partnership body uh, is moving towards you think in february or whenever because it sounds like the conversations are taking place yeah. sound pretty realistic to me about that Bit and a bit of code, you know, in terms of that, and everyone watching what's going on in other places, yeah. but that's where we are probably heading to. I think, uh, without using code, I think it's inevitable that the LRF meetings over the coming year or so there's going to be three or four of them in the next 12 15 months they will be taking papers with recommendations for change. Yeah, I think that's you know, okay. Okay, other questions then, because I think we've reached the end. I think almost certainly. I mean, when we come to reflect, and, and thank you very much for uh, you've engaged with us. Um, and, you know, and I think, you know, we are, I think we can say, uh, you know, um, your part, we're very pleased that you're there. I think mean, Londoners should be pleased that you're there, to be honest, and doing the work that you're doing in coordinating with partners and doing some of that work that you outlined earlier on, because the testing and preparation issue is key here. But, you know, I think we do need the, to learn the lessons pretty quickly of what took place and what can we do better. I think we will be doing another session on this and we'll certainly consult with you know, group leaders, individuals about what that other session look like, looks like and how do we bring people together. Is that, and please, we'd like, you know, as, you know, it's just not uh, much information as possible to share because we want to support you in your work, to be honest. Yeah. And if we can give that support, we'll continue to do that. Thank you. I'd, I'd yeah. certainly be keen to bring something back on. Yeah. We spoke about you know, ideas about local authorities, but also the um, assurance side of things as well for London. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of that, I don't think we need to do any more except do the formal bit at the end of that. We're asked to note the report um, and note the discussions arising from the questions we've asked. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. Um, then we move on to item seven. Uh, we've got a report before us. Are there any questions to the officer? Okay, can we uh, agree then uh, in terms of that as a way forward on item seven, which is the further work of the assembly? Item eight, the secretary quarterly review, quarter one. Any questions to officers? Okay, you're asked to note the core secretary quarterly review for the first quarter 2018. Uh, um, uh, yeah, sorry, just phone by saying. Nine, work programme for the GLA Oversight Committee. You're asked to note the work programme for 2017-18 as set out in the report. Um, we can identify any additional issues outside this meeting. Can we agree that? Uh, item 10, uh, date of next meeting is Wednesday the 11th of October 2017 at 2pm, Committee Room 5. Item 11, I have only got one really announcement I want to say. This is Vishal's last meeting with us. Can I thank him for the support that he's shown to all the Assembly members in carrying out their duties? Uh, you know, it's not a sad occasion because you're going on to greater things in the, I think it's London Borough of Harrow? That's correct, yes. Um, so we wish you well in that and we hope you have enjoyed and we've not caused you too many problems <laughs> with our style as well as uh, the way that we carry out our duties. But thank, thank you very much for the work we've done. Okay, and being that, there is no other, any other urgent business to declare the meeting closed. Thank you. Good. Yeah.